All right, it being 7.30, uh, get the uh, February 12th conservation meeting going. I appreciate uh, everybody coming. We've got a full agenda. Um, and we're starting a half hour later than usual. Um, if for anybody that's here, we've got a full crowd. There's a sign-in sheet at the door. Um, please, uh, please remember to sign in. And this is being broadcast on public access Verizon 33 and Comcast 32. Um, we'll start with our first hearing of the day. It's uh, Notice of Intent 135, 139, 149 R. Howard Street. Uh, Chuck, do you have the number on here? Oh. You actually, will we open the public hearing on the notice of intent filed by Kevin Greenwood Infrastructure Holdings under Wetlands Protection Act uh, 131, 40, and the Reading Wetland Protection Bylaw um, for the uh, proposed construction of a subdivision road infiltration based in two family houses within the 100 foot buffer zone of a BVW as part of a six lot subdivision. Uh, map number and deep dual DEP file number 270 Um I'll now introduce the commission, starting from my right. David Panett. John Sullivan. Martha Moore. Jenny Scanlon, Vice Chair. Michael Flynn, Chair. Tay Evans-Rhodes. Nicola Mazur. Scott Keefe. Uh, Chuck Tironi, Conservation Administrator. So we'll have the applicant come and present the project. Before you do, I'll just, obviously, you can see we've got a lot of new faces here today. Um, so. And, and this has certainly changed over the, the last few months. So if you could kind of make sure we give everybody kind of up to speed as to where we are today and what, what you've got. Thank you. I am. Uh, for the record, Andy Street, Civil Design Consultants mm -hmm. here um, on behalf of the applicant, Kevin Greenwood, as mentioned, with Infrastructure Holdings. Also with us tonight is Jamie Medea, uh, counsel for the applicant, and uh, Maureen Harrell from, from the Morris Environmental, the web and scientist on the applicant's uh, side. <coughs> so we made some plans on the board, but but as um, the chair just mentioned, my, my plan tonight is to kind of um, roll it back to the beginning, I guess, kind of run through where, where we started and where we uh, come to date and um, talk about uh, what um, where, where we're at today. Um, we, uh, we did a renotification process. There was a lot of changes to this commission since we started. We started this the first time we were here was back in January of last year. So uh, the commission's changed. Uh, working with uh, Chuck and the town's council, we uh, we renotified the butters. We filed in the paper um, with the intent of. Uh, making a presentation like I'm about to give and, and making everyone on the commission um, fully aware and informed so that I think when this comes to a vote, they'll be uh, uh, well, well suited to do so. Uh, so while the plan's coming up, just to give some background on, on what we have uh, from a meeting schedule, where we've been, I mentioned in January of 19 was the first... January of 2019 was the first meeting with, with this commission. Uh, that same month, we did a, a, a DRT, which is a, a meeting with the department heads. Um, Chuck was there, planner, uh, DPW, fire, police, things like that. Uh, in February was our first meeting with the um, Community Planning Development Commission, the CPDC. Uh, after that, we had two site walks. I'm sorry, I'm standing here. That's beautiful. We had, we had two site walks with this commission, one in May and one in October. Uh, those were um, really working through the delineation of the uh, wetlands themselves that are, that are on site is really what took place over that stretch of time and then came back to this commission uh, later in October where at that meeting uh, there seemed to be a, a, was a consensus over the uh, delineation of the, of the wetlands. Um, it came again in November of 19, and then uh, most recently we were at the CPDC in January, uh, and then again just on Monday, uh, and on Monday the, the CPDC approved um, the project, you know, to their standard zoning and subdivision rights and things like that. So um, that's kind of the, the path we've taken to get to where we are today. Um, in general, yeah, no, that's fine. I'm trying to stall. I'm just talking. <laughs> <about that. laughs> so I'm just going to keep 
broad strokes here, but in general, we've worked um, uh, pretty hard with, with people like the town engineer, um, the CPDC, this commission, um, the, the uh, town's um, consultants, uh, represented by uh, Janet from Horsey Whitten here, um, to, to bring this into compliance with um, certainly planning regs, because um, they approved it Monday, and also with this commission. So, as it really stands today, we feel as though we uh, have addressed uh, or in compliance with both local and state regs, um, but certainly we'll run through the project itself, and if there's more questions about um, where, where we uh, fit, we can work more than happy to, to address those as well. While, while you're all still searching, I'll just add just the... Introduce yourself, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. Jamie Medea, um, and I represent the um, owner of the property. Mm -hmm. um, the Thank you. But I was just going to say to um, make clear what Andy was saying, the project had been through extensive horsley Whitman review on where the wetland resources were. <laughs> got your predecessor's agreement as to where those were, and then went into final design for stormwater to make sure that in relation to those resource water, resource areas, um, they, they, of course, they went and was also satisfied with the nature of the stormwater design or any other issues. So what we see today, I think, is Horsley they wouldn't um, able to speak with you about independent third-party review of that aspect of the project. And um, we, Chuck and I discussed it, and he discussed it with your town council, that it made sense um, for all of you to have a complete review of what had been done um, so that you weren't both in a bind of no quorum and um, you would have a full sense of what the project was, rather than just picking up what we left off. So I can talk about the wetlands a little bit. My name's Maureen Harold. I'm from NOAA's Environmental Services. If you go to page C2 of your packet, that shows you the existing conditions plan of the site. So the site's located on Howard Street, between Howard Street and West Cross Road. And we have a 4.11 acre piece of land. There's two existing single family dwellings uh, number 135 and 139 off this piece of land. Um, U.S. Environmental flagged the property in August of 2018. A notice of intent was filed with the commission in December of 2018. Um, the A-series wetland that you see at the rear of the property, if you're standing in front of... Um, in front of Howard Street. That's a bordering vegetated wetland. And as such, the commission has a 100-foot buffer zone off of that bordering vegetated wetland. We initially did a site walk with the commission. The commission expressed some concerns with the wetland boundary. Um, it was decided at that point that we would like, the commission would like to send it out to peer review. <coughs> That's when Horsley and Winton got involved in the project. Um, the first site visit was performed May 6 of 2019, and we walked the entire perimeter of the A-Series wetland. Um, we were in 99% agreement. There was one flag added. That was 9A-1. Um, in addition, at that site visit, there was an isolated wetland pocket that we missed. <laughs> That area was flagged as well, and that's shown on the B series of the plan. So that's along the easterly corner of the property. Um, that's 18, 1,805 square feet. That is jurisdictional under the Reading Local Wetland Bylaws. So that is within the commission's jurisdiction. There was um, one questionable area that the commission was uncertain about, and um, that's a drainage ditch. It's labeled on the plan as an existing man-made ditch. And it's um, highlighted on the plan or dashed line to show the drainage ditch. Um, Horsley Witten, Norse Environmental, my client, the engineer. We also did a second site visit 
on October 3rd of 2019. To just take another look at this ditch, to take another look at the soils, to take another look at the vegetation in and around the ditch. And um, it was concluded that it is a drainage ditch. Because it's a drainage ditch, it's not jurisdictional, it's not considered a stream, it's located up gradient of the wetland itself. So the good news is everybody's on the same page in terms of what's within the jurisdiction of the property. So we have a bordering vegetated wetland labeled as the A series. We have an isolated wetland that's labeled as the B series. Anything within 100 feet is located within the town's jurisdiction and we need a permit from the local conservation commission. Um, in addition to Horsley and Witten actually reviewing the resource areas, they also reviewed the engineering for the project and the stormwater for the project. So I can pass that off to Andy and he can go through or those. Or, or Janet. Oh, the commission. I'm Janet Bernardo. I'm a professional engineer with the Horsley Witten Group, and I was uh, we were brought on to do a peer review of this. So. Are you following <laughs> so far? Welcome to all the new members. It's a really great uh, volunteerism thing that you're, that you're all doing and trying to uh, spend some time figuring out what you're, to, what you're here for. Um, have you looked at the plans well enough so you understand? You followed what Maureen was saying about all of the wetlands and the different wetlands that were there. Um, so Amy Ball, who is with Horsley Whitten, she's our professional wetland scientist. She prepared, um, there was, we've written four letters. One of them was strictly regarding the wetlands that was in October. There was a May 29th letter, October letter. The second letter and then the time. But Amy um, was here for the last hearing and she was able to describe those, the wetlands that she saw. Um, there was concern about the ditch and whether that connected the two. There was very extensive soil investigations done there, and it was determined that the smaller piece, that the ditch itself and the smaller piece that was closer to Howard Street was not actually a resource area. So as Maureen explained, there is the larger BBW and the isolated vegetated wetland. And Amy was able to accept that and confirm and be, was in agreement with what is shown on the plans that you have in front of you. So wetlands were caught up. Um, then the stormwater design has changed it has changed slightly all along the way because part of the goal was adding some um, more green infrastructure. There was various infiltration basins. That kind of have shifted. There was more were added. Swales were added. Now catch basins have been added. I'll let we can let Andy Great. present the. Okay, so now I can come back. In. Yeah, yes, Perfect. absolutely. We want to have you back. <coughs> All right. So Maureen's talked a bit about the site itself. Um, I mentioned how we've been uh, working on this project with with the with the town uh, for about a year, um, and despite that length of time, the the changes to the the general makeup of this project have not been overly significant. Um, Maureen mentioned that there was an additional wetland area that was added here. Um, we've tweaked some of the drainage, but this project came in as a six lot subdivision that was accessed by about 350 feet of roadway extending off of Howard Street, and that's what it remains today. So really kind of the, the biggest change that, that came about is we initially had this roadway, we had these lots, we had Lot 4's house located towards the front of the lot. As we worked through the wetlands delineation, uh, the, when this wetland pocket was added, the house and the pond were flipped. So there was a house here and a pond in the back. And then when this wetland came into play, the house moved to the back and the pond to the front. Uh, the utilities we have, this is fully sewered, connecting in Howard Street, uh, water connects in Howard Street. All the utilities will connect in Howard Street. That came in in 2019 that way and remains the same today. Um, the mechanism where we control runoff and how we get it to the stormwater facilities is, has changed slightly. Uh, when we had this pond in the back, the majority of this road would, would flow towards the rear of the roadway through a swale that made it to that pond. Um, working with the town engineer, this commission, um, that has been tweaked uh, quite a bit. Certainly the pond came forward, 
and we now have a catch basin system with some manholes that will collect the runoff from really the majority of the road and the driveways, um, some of the landscaped areas, you get it into this infiltration basin, which has a, uh, a, an overflow that heads directly towards the wetland. Um, so from a stormwater perspective, I think this is actually a stronger design. It, it's, it's closer to the roadway, it directs overflow directly towards the wetland as opposed to being back towards the rear of the parcel where it was much closer to the abutters and, and um, uh, a little, the, the outlet was not as direct right to the wetland area there. Um, outside of that, we have also, we worked through a number of comments and questions with, with planning, the, the town engineer. Um, we've, uh, most recently, the, the, these, these aren't necessarily uh, in the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction, but the right-of-way was widened. That a little more area for the town to own, but the pavement width itself has been, was originally 24 feet wide and continues to be 24 feet wide. So using that width, we vetted this with the town engineer and the fire department to make sure that that access is, is known. Um, we have also, this is, the, these, a lot of these changes are really kind of the first round of changes. And that, these are, this was the big change. We really had one major revision, which resulted in this house and the pond flipping, um, and then introducing some of this closed range system. And most recently, it was more of a, of a fine tuning where we um, added some more catch basins, kind of changed the, the nature of the roadway and things like that. But from a, uh, a wetlands perspective and the conservation's perspective, we've been pretty consistent with the two houses <coughs> in the 100 foot buffer zone. You know, maybe this, you know, this oval shape here of the cul de sac itself being in the 100 foot buffer zone and the stormwater management system also located within juris uh, the jurisdiction. So, uh, we've done soil testing out here. It was pretty extensive soil testing done to um, check on soil conditions, groundwater. And we used um, we used partly to, to site the houses, get some grades because we need to have those houses a certain separation from the from the groundwater itself. And then also for the, the stormwater system, we used the inf information we got from those test pits to to design that infiltration basin, uh, and also the infiltration systems that go with the house uh, to, to handle the appropriate amount of, of stormwater runoff. Um, really with the goal, you know, in line with the, both the town standards and also state, federal standards to, to capture, treat uh, stormwater, and then also discharge it, uh, both at a, a rate and a volume that's equal or less than what um, exists today. Once we got through that, that, that first set of changes, we had still a few minor comments. Um, Horsley Witten had a few items in their, in their last letter. Uh, we tweaked the mounting analysis. We used some more conservative values um, that were recommended by them in their, in their review. Um, showed that the mounting analysis for this infiltration basin uh, still worked. The pond was still in compliance. Um, we also did some, some kind of clarification to these each of these roofs has a has a subsurface system, so that runoff collected on the roof goes underground and into the into the uh, gets captured underground and then infiltrated underground as opposed to flowing to the road into the into the pond itself. Uh, that was really that was revision number two. So it was very kind of minor at that point. It's more clarification, um, but we have. You know, continue to stay in touch with, with Chuck and, and the town engineer who, who reviewed this from a stormwater perspective too and we, we addressed his concerns um, as well as, as Horsley Witten. So, um, I'll let you weigh in a little more on your review if you want. Um, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, happy to answer any questions, any concerns, of course. Um, in, in general, what we're looking at is a, a buffer zone project. I mean, we have, we're not in directly impacting any wetlands. Um, the town has a local 25-foot zone of uh, natural vegetation that, vegetation that we're not impacting. We have very minor impacts here and here with some retaining walls that um, kind of make those lots better. We could probably work around if we, if we really needed to. Um, and uh, outside of that, we're talking about two houses, a little bit of roadway, and some stormwater systems in the buffer zone itself. So as it stands today, at least from what I've gathered from... Um, Certainly on the planning side, as they've proved it on Monday, uh, from the town engineer and even reading through Horsey Witten's last letter, I, I, we don't really have any comments or concerns related to our compliance with you know, all applicable regulations. Um, and feel like we've worked pretty hard to, to bring this to a spot where, uh, where it is today. Um, 
so I, I think with that, um, I don't know if you want to turn it back, or I'm happy to answer questions, or however you want to. Yeah, uh, before we turn to questions from the commission, yeah, I'll, I'll take a second. Um, so one thing that, as a, as a newer commission, are you aware of the Massachusetts stormwater standards and what that actually means? So, um, under the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, there's Massachusetts stormwater standards that have been um, kind of solely in existence since 2008. Okay. They okay. are probably changing any minute now, but they keep telling us that. So we're expecting a change, so don't get too comfortable with them now. However, there's 10 standards. Um, the first standard requires um, any discharge to a wetland is not allowed to be, go if it's a new conveyance, new pipe going into a wetland system, um, cannot have erosion, and it must be treated and cannot have erosion, cause erosion. So that's the velocity of a pipe discharging could cause erosion in a wetland, so we try to verify that anything discharging is treated in some manner with a, whether it's treated with a, a storm scepter kind of a device uh, or a fire or a rain garden or this catch basins is various means to treat them. And then discharging it out, it shouldn't have any erosion causing, so it shouldn't be going too fast. And sometimes they have to put a riprap apron or something down so that the water doesn't go too fast and then cause it. So this application, that's like the first thing that we do in, in how our letter is kind of listed is going through those 10 standards. So this application, um, we verified that they weren't causing erosion into the wetland and that they were providing treatment with the infiltration basin and the swales, as well as the infiltration trench that's right along the driveway for lot four. So that runoff needed to have some type of treatment. So they put, have put an infiltration trench beside the driveway, which is basically I think it's two and a half feet wide, maybe two feet deep, full of stones. Sediment comes off the driveway, it goes into this trench, and, and it, that provides a treatment. Standard two means that post-development runoff cannot exceed pre-development runoff. So they are required to, by putting in the infiltration chambers underneath for taking the roof runoff, as well as the infiltration basin, um, there's two different ones. One was direct runoff from other properties, and this larger one that's really taking the driveway runoff. That infiltration basin slows down all of the runoff so that it doesn't in it cannot increase. Because usually, if you sort of can visualize taking a parking lot, a grass area, and making it a parking lot, it's going to run off a lot faster. So they cannot increase that flow. So they have to do something to slow it down. So they slowed it down for the infiltration basin. So we went through those calculations. That tends to be the most technical piece of this. And there's this hydrocat analysis that most engineers use. And they go through various storm events. They need to do the two-year event, which is about three inches, something in that order. Um, the 10-year event, 100-year event. So the 100-year um, storm is the most we're looking at right now. That may increase with the storm, new stormwater standards going forward. but. As climate change is happening, uh, everybody's thinking that it's raining a lot more often, but at the moment we're still looking at the 210 and 100. So that's what they had to show us next. And so we went through and had some various comments about, you know, did they look at the infiltration rate? Did we agree with that rate that they were using for the soils that they found? Um, and did we agree with their how long it took to go from point A to point B. Do we agree with the soils and their surface material that was going through? So we, that's the very technical calculations that we're able to kind of go and check through each of the pieces. Um, with this latest change, the town engineer has asked them to put in catch basins and manholes. So this is a new pipe system. Before it was basically sheet flowing all the way down the roadway. It's not that long of a roadway, but... Um, this catch basin will make it so that there's not really a concern of icing because that tends to be the problem when you don't have catch basins that it, the, the icing happens on the street. So now they're capturing that and the catch basins add another <coughs> level of removing sediment. So that's a, that's a bonus, definitely. The, um, so in, and on our, my letter, the February 10th letter lists, um, there's a table on one of the pages that shows 
the different, I just listed the um, 100 year storm because that's an easy one. To, it gets kind of messy if you list too many of them. For, for our letter, the applicant has included all that information in their report. But I was just kind of showing the commission um, basically pre development, post development flows, as well as pre development and post development volume of runoff. That's not required from the mass stormwater standards, but it's one of the pieces that everybody's trying to hold back volume um, so that you're not adding more runoff, just slower. I mean, more volume, more amount of water. So they're slowing down the water as well as um, not increasing the volume, which is <coughs> happening in the infiltration basin. So by putting it into the ground, they're not, um, which, is, which is something that we're going to talk about again, so I don't, don't forget that point. Um, so standard three, basically, is regarding recharge, and standard three requires applicants to recharge stormwater in some manner, and they need to show that they're not, um, that they're, the proposed recharge is meeting, you know, whatever's going into the ground under existing conditions, so if it's all woods and trees and a lot of runoff is going into the ground automatically, they need to replicate that under proposed conditions. So, again, there's calculations involved, the amount of runoff that's going into the infiltration basin, what's infiltrating into the ground, that qualifies as their recharge calculation. The stormwater standards have formulas and we check and make sure that we agree with their, that they've done their formulas correctly. Um, and we've had comments and then they responded to those comments and we were able to say, all right, we're in agreement. Standard four has to do with their total uh, suspended solids, TSS removal, and that's the pollutants and basically the sands and the leaves and the junk that gets into the catch basins and, and gets caught up and you don't want that to get into your wetlands as you've, I'm sure, seen it on the highways and whatnot and why not going in. So we're trying to hold that out. So that gets caught in the catch basin. That's first step. It gets caught in their forebay, which is the second step. So that's two things that they've already done before it gets into the infiltration basin. So the catch basins are assuming 25% removal. That's what the state is allowed at. The forebay gets of another 25% removal. So they've removed 44% of whatever those sediments are, the sands and the bits and the what's. Not um, before it gets to the infiltration basin because you don't want to clog the basin because you want that to go through. So they met that requirement along the way, and then it goes into the infiltration basin. Infiltration basins themselves give an automatic 80% removal. That's their target is to have 80% of the TSS removal. And um, now we're going to start removing phosphorus. <coughs> infiltration basins can also remove phosphorus. So that the infiltration basins are always a, a bonus. Um, standard five has to do with a land use of higher potential pollutant loads, which basically is your gas stations, junkyards, larger um, shopping centers that have a thousand vehicles per day of, tra of traffic. Um, this does not qualify as a <coughs> land use with higher potential pollutant loads, so that's what we stated. Uh, standard six is if it's a project within a um, critical area or a, a drinking water supply, a well is owned to by the state requirements. Um, this project is not within a critical area, so that standard six does not apply. Standard seven is if it was a redevelopment. So if you have your um, parking lot that somebody wants to redevelop, if they're removing in, um, some of that impervious area, then it qualifies as a redevelopment. If you're adding impervious area to this property, so even though it was two houses that they were taking down, it added impervious, so it does not qualify as redevelopment. Gives them a little bit more of a leeway on some of the requirements. Um, standard eight requires erosion controls and under construction. Am I going too fast? You good? Am I going to oh, Are you bored now? Okay. Um, Standard eight is, is about erosion control and making sure that they are meeting that under construct for construction. So they have their hay bale lines, they have their construction entrance, um, making sure that there's a, a silt fence. Uh, the commission wants to make sure that that wetland is protected and that sediment doesn't get into it. And that's something that you see more often in construction because, you know, they're digging up stuff and it's dirty and it's messy and then 
everything starts to slide. This is a relatively flat site, so it's not as big of a concern. Some of the super slides, you really see the, um, the, the erosion happen. So that's what the hay bale line, the silt sock, compost sock, there's various names for these um, erosion control barriers, but they definitely have, their, they're showing their line. Um, during construction, they're gonna wanna make sure that that stays solid and doesn't get um, decay or get moved around. And, so that's something that happens during construction to really make sure that it's being protected the entire time for both the BBW as well as the isolated vegetative wetland. Uh, standard nine is a long-term operation and maintenance. So basically this roadway is going to be maintained and, and I believe the infiltration basin associated with it and the catch basins are being maintained by the town DPW. Is that true that the infiltration basin is um, so one of my comments on this was to make sure that the DPW was in agreement with the operation and maintenance. I believe the town engineers reviewed it, and I just didn't know that for a fact, but I'm assuming that the town engineer has reviewed it. And so the DPW will have to buy in on, on this, and that's probably why he wanted the catch basins. Um, they know how to clean catch basins. They do it a lot, but they don't always know how to do, like, bioretention areas. They're a little trickier, but we like them. Um, and standard 10 is an illicit discharge statement that basically is supposed to be provided by the property owner saying that they are not putting any illicit discharge towards the wetland. Um, they're not tying their sewer system in and letting it flow into the stormwater system is basically, it's kind of a, every, like let the home, let the property owner understand that Yes, he knows that they were not supposed to tie that sewer system in and out, and they, they can't be ignorant about it is kind of the goal. Um, we have some, so those are the 10 standards that basically every project that, um, not every project, but many projects that come before you may have to, not the single family houses, but any subdivision that has more than four houses is required to meet these 10 standards. So that's a basis. There's other, I mean, site, like McDonald's comes, and, but um, we had a Janet, few other. Just a quick question, um, and I think you've kind of given us this, but just so we've got it clearly, you know, there's been obviously back and forth. You guys have done multiple letters. At this point, you feel like they've resolved the issues to yes. meet the ten standards. Here. Yes, basically, our February tenth letter says that they um, either we they already addressed the our concerns, or um, the, the one comment that they we would like to see addressed in some manner is, you know, the abutters wrote a letter as well. And they have some concern about the flow and under existing conditions, what's happening is most of the existing site flows towards this BBW. Not all of it, but probably two thirds of it. Under proposed conditions, you see this roadway and the houses go to the individual systems, but the driveways and the roadway go to this infiltration basin over here, which even though it's overflowing to this BBW, it's infiltrating closer to the isolated vegetated wetland. And that has the neighbors anxious. Um, I've had, they did a mounting <laughs> analysis. We asked them to the mounting analysis was part of their recharge requirement. Uh, basically, if um, if the separation of the bottom of the basin and the groundwater that they tested, they figured out where that was by all their test fits. If that's, that has to be at least two feet, it could be four feet is preferred. But if it's less than, if it's between two and four, they need to do a mounting analysis. Um, it, and they're, and, so. Um, that is a calculation that has various uh, con con specification, no, that's not the right word, um, like specific yield coefficients. Various coefficients because of the soil, because of the infiltration rate, it just depends on the size of the system. Um, so they originally gave us that in December, or maybe before that, and in December we said, um, we wanted the constraints to be a little bit more conservative. So they redid that mounting analysis calculation and have determined that the what happens is all the water is going into one spot, 
now. And so it actually raises the groundwater immediately underneath that spot, underneath the basin as a whole. The groundwater raises because it's all kind of concentrated. And then it disperses down and goes out. So if it goes so high that it comes into the basin, then they've taken up their storage. So it can't come into the basin is part of the trick. So their calculation shows it comes for that two feet, it comes up to 1.9 feet. So it's not in the basin, so that's good. And then the next piece of the, the formula kind of shows how far outside of the basin it goes. And it mounts because it kind of extends along. So once it gets to 50 feet outside of this basin, it no longer is impacting the groundwater table, which is a good thing. Property line is about 75 feet away. However, the neighbors are anxious about this. And there's, you know, there's, uh, even though the cal I had a long conversation with our hydrolog hydrologist, and he was like, it shows that it's not increasing off the, after the 50 feet. It's a good calculation. Um, I think putting a underground, under drain in the middle of that high infiltration basin would be a way to ease some of the concerns from the neighbors to take, so instead of allowing it to, it kind of uh, goes everywhere, but well, directing it a little bit more to the BBW, it will be that much more confident that it's getting back to the BBW and not just going underground right to that isolated vegetated wetland off the bat. So it's, the calculations show that it's fine. Um, it's just kind of an extra bit of security. Can I, um, I just want to hear, um, did you, so you looked at the stormwater I know this has gone through extensive review multiple times, um, and I acknowledge that. <coughs> the design storms? Yep. Did you have any issue with those design storm quantities? The depth of the precipitation depth? The, uh, yeah, the, the amount of... Well, they had to do the two ten and 100. Right. Um, I... They would have met the requirements under the stormwater bylaw. I don't, under the stormwater standards, I mean, did, what did you use for the, for your rates? What did you use for the inches? Oh, up here. For the 100 year, it was 6.2. 6 6.5. 6 6.5. Which is what, under the Massachusetts stormwater standards, they're using what's technical paper number 40, which allows the 6.5 for this area. Um, what they're probably going to, what Mass Stormwater Standards is going to, is the either the NOAA Atlas 14 or the Cornell precipitation, which is closer to eight inches. Um, it's not a requirement at this moment for the town. So it makes it difficult to require them to do something more stringent. It, well, so it's good to know, though. But right, it's good to know. I mean, it, it, and and, the, and you can start requiring your applicants to in, have their stormwater standards, standards precipitation rates. <coughs> I apologize for it's a little separate from this application, but do you see towns that have yes require that? Many. Yeah. We've had a number of discussions. Yeah. I'll keep talking. Yeah. It's it's very it's very popular. <laughs> and um and, and the and the likelihood is the Mass DEP is going to change their requirements hopefully in the next six months. So then maybe you don't have to. Hmm. So, um, in our, our February 10th letter, there are some recommendations that we have for the commission that you may want to include as special conditions. Um, and the only, so the only thing that 
you really see, I do feel like we went extensively through this stormwater design. Um, it is my belief from my, my professional opinion that the design as it stands um, meets the stormwater standards. Uh, I think just as an added comfort level, putting an under drain in the, in the infiltration basin to have it draining through the wetland may be helpful. Can I, can I just, I, I hear you on that, on that point. One of the, one of the things I sort of think about, about that is if putting in an under drain um, reduces the retention time between that and the wetland, um, you know, part of what I'm, I am aiming for in approving this is all the residents that abut the, um, which way is more? I don't know. <laughs> which the abut the back side. The yeah, the top of the page and the yep. left side of the page. Yep. They are most affected directly by the water level in that wetland. So yes. they are going to want to see that water level absolutely not increase any more than it already does in response to storms. And if ideally, you know, maybe maybe a little bit better response to storms. Yeah, and, you know, and, and as so it maybe stands, this BBW, as the design stands today, shows the calculations on the hydrocarbon calculations show that it is not increasing volume or runoff to that BBW. <clears throat> what if Sorry. No, no what if what if the under drain went from the storm water, the emergent, the infiltration basin, to the isolated wetland? Well, it's already doing that. You don't need it to, because under the groundwater, it's just going in. It's kind of the groundwater is just, it's just drilling it there. Uh, and and I guess my feeling about it is that under under existing. The site kind of flows towards this BBW. Sure. Under proposed, the site is now with this basin kind of flowing towards the isolated vegetative wetland because of the groundwater. It has to get a foot deep before it will go out this outlet pipe. So that foot of water is is going to get dispersed underneath the whole system, which will go to the isolated vegetative wetland as well. But the surface contours are kind of pulling it north. Okay, so so the rim, so the rim inside the detention basin is at 162. It, it's a foot higher than the bottom. I I just know that much. The the outlet. I'm saying two feet, maybe, and maybe the engineer can comment on oh, that. Two feet. The elevation between one. the top of the the POS dash one. There's a orifice in there. Rim, the top rim of that is at 162. Is that what I'm reading correctly on the plan? 162, correct. So the top of rim is like two feet above the bottom of the graded detention basin. Correct. But there's an orifice in the middle. Right, but that's emergency. The orifice in the middle is the inflow from the street. Is this no. I guess I guess I'm really interested in the design of this infiltration basin, and is is that in the design drawings here? It is. Yeah. There's, Tell me what page. There's so there's details. I, I just flipped to the outlet structure that's detailed on B uh, two. B two. And there's some uh, there's some uh, there's some details there as well. We have a point. Point me to them, please. So B two. Uh, the big long detail in the bottom of the page. No. That's the outlet structure. <coughs> so we have uh, a inlet to that structure one foot above the bottom of the pond, and then a pipe coming out of that inside the structure. Oh, okay, it's going to be sort of like a head wall. Yeah, right. The grade on top is really kind of worst case. You know, it's not meant to be. Triggered, but it's there if that's something were to fail, water can still get out of it. Okay, that and the bottom, the bottom of that pipe is the 162. The, no. The, no. the sorry, the, the top of the grate is 162 of the very. <laughs> Too many 
letters. So Sorry. I, I scribbled it all inverse, the time. The inverse of the outlet is 160. This and this. Okay. This is 161. <laughs> here. Just put it on the plate. Yeah, yeah, that's what I had to do. This, this one is 161. No, this that's one. See, yeah, 161. Which is this. And that's 160, 22. Which is this. This is one. This is the oh. This thank is one. you, thank you, thank you. Took okay. <laughs> so that okay. pipe, that pipe's lower to get under the. Oh, uh, oh, I see. So, so there's a chamber. Yeah, it's it's uh, similar to a manhole type thing. You know, it's just the concrete, concrete structure. And back on C5, there's a cross section, a profile of the basin as well. And so, scales exaggerated. So. so, in which type of design storm, like a two hour or a, does this, does that start to spill over? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it does, it, it, the design, I mean, we have very little flow going to that well. So, that thing holds water for as, as long as possible. It's just not a lot of water leaving that. Okay, so that overflows into the wetland during the 100-year storm? Or yeah, I would have to. Uh, I know. Yeah, because it, yeah, it's more than I know it's a challenging of, question, yeah. but. Well, no, I mean, it's, I just didn't print the 100-page uh, transport. The hydrogen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so. Well, you've got one. Yeah. So design point one, which is the wetlands. We're talking about one CFS in the hundred year, one point one anyway. So it's very small amount of oh. flow that's going there just in the hundred year storm. Um, oh. Right, I know, I know. There's all the Caltech chambers for the roof infiltration. I'm sure they make a big difference. It was originally a very different. Yeah, a big difference. Does this, this, all this, what we're talking about here, does this even take into consideration the other mitigating factors that all of these houses have their own dry wells? The calculations, the hydraulic calculations basically separate the houses and the imperviousness of the houses. Um, from the road. So this infiltration basin is just taking the roadway and the driveway, and that's what is shown in the calculation. Yeah, which is right. Ex um, except I was going to say, except the back house, the lot that's, four yeah, house. That's why they have which has a separate drip trench. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So. I don't know if we moved on from your question, but but that that outlet lets out a tenth of a CFS in the ten-year storm, so it's triggered then, but we're you know very small amounts of water then, and then in the two, so it you know it does in subsequent storms as well. I can check the, okay. the two it, as well. But is that infiltration basin going to be just grass? Like I'm stuck. Yeah, I mean, it, um, loam and seed. Just yeah, it's got a. a Right. <coughs> Correct. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yep. And it's not going to have any sort of impervious base. It is not. No. It is not. It's it will have it was the the uh, four bay will be stone, but not impervious. But right, right. To slow down the grass, to, yeah. to capture the treatment, the treatment and all that. Yeah. The initial yeah. surge of sediment should there be any from Correct. the storm drains or yeah. something like that during a. And we recommended that they already yeah. replace it with yep. two point four one. Yep, I saw that. I had I had another question. <laughs> We're gonna move on from the basin for a second. The um, the grading between the end of the cul de sac and the wetland. I know these are one foot contours. Um, the slope between that area. I'm just wondering, are we over our, was it Chuck, three to one slope? It is three to one. Are we over that in that little area? By the retaining wall, right? The low side of the retaining, oh, in there. Okay. Um, yeah, that area. 
Yeah, I have to check that. It looks steeper than that. And we it does look steeper. Just, so just to my view, that was something I just flagged sure. looking at Is this. Is that something that the commission um, would prefer to see a wall than a three-to-one or either a three-to-one slope or a wall or, which, or a shorter road? Or yeah, shorter. Sure. Yes, you know. Can you do that? So, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. no, I, I, I mean, I can't tell the fire department uh, to do that, but before we get too far down the road, no. that's an area that I was going to talk about for okay. that's going to get snow in it. And I asked Andy yeah. this afternoon to to think about that mm -hmm. and to try to prevent that road snow <laughs> from going into the wetland. So it might be a retaining wall. Right. Right. Something's going to happen there. Yep, those are my questions. Does anybody else have, have a question? I've got a couple of questions. So before you start, uh, I have to yeah. make this public service announcement. So there's a gray Audi in the parking lot, uh, 380720 with the lights on. If anyone wants to go out and shut that off. I don't know if it's in this yeah, meeting or some other, some other meeting. Okay. So... Uh, Again, getting out of the stormwater a little bit and more to the, the project. You said, uh, I think you addressed it a little bit, but you mentioned some minor things within the 35-foot zone. Do you have a list of what's within the 35-foot? Yeah, so it is. Are these structures like roadways or wall, retaining walls? As far as something <laughs> permanent, the corner of this wall clips it and the corner of this wall clips it. Okay. I mean, I think, what, what did we figure out? It was, uh, I think the fee when you did it all 25 foot was $40. Okay. So it's yeah. clear, like 34 feet of, of retaining wall to support the driveway. And this one was really put in um, through discussions with this commission to make the area around the house flatter. So um, that's why that one's there. Uh, so, you know, very small amount of, of permanent fixtures in the, and certainly no houses, but um, that's really all that's is there a roadway? There's no roadway, no. Yeah, the 35 is, is it this? So the roadway is, the roadway is entirely out of it. Yeah. And so the requirement is permanent fixtures would be, uh, have a fee associated with them, but temporary don't, and the 35 foot. Yep. So Andy, the, the um, so you clipped the corner over here at this proposed house, it's lot three. Um, the retaining wall. Mm -hmm. Is is there any way you could just bring that to the 35 foot line, or is there a reason why, other than it's a nice angle there? Yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that's about my scale. I mean, yeah, certainly we could pull it in a little bit. I mean, the idea was to give that used to be just a slope right off the side there, and um, just providing some accessibility around the house was the intent. So if that's a concern of the commission, you know, we can we can pull that in. Yeah. <coughs> Chuck, do you have any other? Um, I think I'm uh, pretty much all set. If people ask the questions. Um, the engineering department has not finished their review, and so I got a call. Uh, from Alex Rizicki at the end of the day, and he was saying that he was looking for the operation and maintenance plan, hadn't got to that point, and so he didn't write the memo saying that they're all okay. So with that, we... we Do we not have a memo, and maybe this is because there's multiple reviews of this, Do we not have a memo from the town in our packet? That was... We might have a memo from... So we got... We got a CPDC memo. Yeah, we got uh, yeah. the CPDC memo. Okay, maybe that's a lot of memos. Yeah, I think there's been some. There's been a lot of changes over the last two weeks. Yeah, and um, the final memo was kind of a response to uh, the Jose Witten response and to update their memo. But, but I, th <laughs> I think what you hit is a, a good point, and, and maybe this is what they're looking. Is the O and M? Is the O and M in the? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, you know what? That's a good question. I don't know because we didn't modify it. So as we continue to submit these, yeah. we try to not. It is a conservation commission, so we're trying to reduce paper, right? <laughs> so, but um, but that's what is certainly included in previous iterations of this. Report. Yeah. So and it, since it didn't change, we probably didn't tuck it into this current version. And we certainly submit that. If that's a. If that's a. Oh no, we have. Oh no, just the sketches is what we provide. So the, the the O and M manual that's been previously submitted, even with the new structures or yeah. the, there's no. Yeah. The, the last time we did an O and M plan, we had drain structures. Okay. So that that maintenance those maintenance procedures were included. In that. I will say I don't. Is it, and did, we got a letter from the town engineer. I know it was for CPDC. Um, I don't know if you mentioned a different person, so I don't. I don't know who else is. So viewing so it. Ryan and Alex, um, they're the town engineers, yeah. and uh, Alex reviewed. I think the last thing he reviewed was, like I said, the Hosey Winton response. Okay. And but I asked him when I sent that to him for some sort of uh, memo for tonight's meeting, and he got back to me that he doesn't have one. Okay. One's not available. Yeah. Okay. I'm just asking. We this, the one we got for the CPDC was clean. I think he said we addressed everything. So I just didn't realize that there was another um, review for the. <coughs> yeah, we're we're looking for a memo, but um, I don't think any of the issues that he brought up are something that we couldn't solve. You know. It's, I mean, in between meetings, we we'd like to have the memo and file from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then, I, I guess, do you have any thoughts, Andy, on the the drain and um, the 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 ditch in, within the? No, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going back to stormwater a little bit and, and Janet's recommendation for you know adding a a pipe leading to the the wetland. Yeah, I mean, well, as Janet mentioned, I mean, we do comply. Yeah. Right? So, so it works per the regulations. I mean, that being said, you know, we, we do under drains. A lot of times we'll do an under drain into the outlet structure. You're, you're referring oh, to yeah. something. That's fine, too. Yeah. That I mean, would be okay. I guess my only thought was if we just had a pipe in there that was just directing water that was perforated, then it would just kind of continually flow right in. It, it wouldn't infiltrate as it was designed. Um, so. It wouldn't infiltrate. Yeah, that's, so I, that's true, which I have thought about that a little bit. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> we can certainly put something in. A lot of times we'll have, it, even, a lot of times we use them as an emergency situation. It's got a, a valve on it even, so if the pond fails or it's not draining at all, and it's, you know, then we have real problems for the neighborhood and the, these houses and things, we can just open that up. You know, we can, we're more than happy to put that in. That's not a big deal if the commission is interested and in it. And maybe it has so. become a, an extra, if you put it in and have it plugged, and then if all of a sudden people are finding that there's too much, the groundwater is too high, it gets opened. Right. I mean, I know in situations like we're facing with these, this season, you know, I, the ponds we do are, the water just sits because it freezes, thaws, freezes, you know what I mean? So yep. it, sometimes it's helpful to have that just to kind of drain them out a little bit. So we can certainly do that. That's not a problem. Okay. If we could ask for, if I may, um, clarity from whatever you or your consultant is recommending, either in a condition of an order of conditions, or if you're asking to see it done before that condition, please be explicit and tell us to do it, and we will do it. Yeah. I'm hearing discussion and not a conclusion, so I'd be grateful to hear a conclusion. Yeah, and, and what I think I'd like to hear is, you know, I think that we're still open to more discussion, and what I, I hope we can walk away with this is kind of steps of are these items addressed does this when do, you know if it's a, a initial pipe what do we need and is everybody on the same page for that I, I do want to make sure we do have conclusions but we and certainly I are one is, I don't know whether I just heard yes design in put it in or if I heard we're still unsure I think it's being recommended okay that's, <coughs> that's, that's what I was hearing I think I would do. so. Yes, design in. Okay. Can I can I just ask one other question? If uh, the uh, the pipe labeled at the ends is FES one and FES two to the left of the road, um, my understanding is that's probably proposed. That's proposed there to sort of mimic the former 
drainage ditch. Correct. Um, is the construction of that, I just want to make sure, <laughs> is the construction of that um, on D2 the typical drain trench detail? Uh, yes, with the landscape. Sort of like, yeah, with the landscape finished on top. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess it goes on the drive, so both it'll get both. Yeah, yeah, I saw it was sort of split. Yeah. So yeah. basically, it's going to be. Um, I see a dashed line. That means perforated pipe with. This is not perforated. No, this would be a solid pipe. That'll be a solid yeah. pipe, but yeah. in in a crushed stone bed. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't have any other questions. Does anybody else have questions? Chuck? No. I'll uh, turn it over to the um, public. Um, please, if you've got a comment, please state your name, your address, um, and, and please address me. Um, I'll open up. Is there any comments from the public? Chuck Casalucio, 52 West Brook Road. I wanted to uh, see if it would be okay for me to uh, present a summary of the comments from the uh, January 6th letter that we. Prepared. Absolutely. So, in that letter, um, it's, it's from the brothers. Uh, we had uh, three primary concerns uh, protecting the wetlands, <coughs> eliminating potential flooding to the area around the development, and, and with the long term uh, operations and maintenance plan. <laughs> With regard to the wetlands, if you wetlands, um, we feel that with the homes up in the northernmost area, it's irresponsible to put uh, those into those uh, areas just because they're kind of shoehorned in. And this one is like in between two wetland areas, and then we also have a pond around it. And then this one is encroaching on the wetland. We want to know that the equivalent amount of water that's currently entering the wetland is, is going to be copied again with, with what we see coming out. Right now, we've got a flow into the wetlands like this, and it's, it's, it covers a large area of, of water coming in. Now what we're going to see is we're going to see two pipes coming in to the wetland area directed from the infiltration basins. And in my mind, and you know, you know better than me, will that provide the water needed to cover the wetland area and maintain it? And, and it's for both areas. Um, you know, most of the, of the water uh, that's gonna come into here is gonna be groundwater directed from the infiltration basin to come into this area here. But I don't know, is, is the groundwater enough to sustain the, the wetland area, or do you need storm water coming in on top of the, the vegetation? Also, um, we're concerned with road salt. Um, you know, road salt along the roads, road salt along the driveways. And, and the impact of that road salt on the wetlands. Um, it, if you've lived in the town long enough, I, I know like on, on our street, on Westcroft Road, people used to come to our house and say, oh, but, you know, what a beautiful tree-lined road you've got. What do we see now? All, all of our trees are, are dying from the amount of salt that we've uh, added to the road the roadways. Um, so th those are the, uh, the, the <coughs> items under trying to protect the wetlands. As, as far as eliminating potential flooding of the butters, um, we have a concern um, for the infiltration, the location of the infiltration pond with the wetland area. This area here is the lowest lying topographic area uh, abutting the properties and um, you know my house is up over here but this property here I, I would think is going to see the most impact from uh, whatever's going on over here 
The, the stormwater calculations don't take into account the issues with groundwater. Um, the, we did a lot of stormwater calculations, and, and it's great. They're showing the amount is, is no different than what it was before. But now, instead of having water infiltrating the entire property evenly, we've got water being directed to, to areas <coughs> where it's going to infiltrate. And with that, it's going to cause a change in the groundwater flow direction. The groundwater flow direction is generally in this direction. But now we're going to see some mounding going on. We're going to see some different things. We're not going to see as much groundwater infiltrate, infiltrating in this area here. And it's going to have an effect on, on things. And with that, we would like to see a groundwater model done. Not a stormwater model, a groundwater model. The groundwater model will tell us elevations of the groundwater. It'll tell us the flow paths. And it's all based on where you're putting the water in and, and, and uh, where it's no longer present. The groundwater mounding calculations that were done, they, they did revise the calculations. And the, and the mounding, uh, they changed the... Uh, the specific yield on the calculations. Um, we also feel that the hydraulic conductivity value needs to be changed as well, based on the, the type of soil that's present out there. What, what hydraulic conductivity value was used? 4.8. 4.8 I think. 4.8 feet per second. Yeah. Can somebody back into what that is, centimeters per second? Can you Sorry. It's just kind of high level math. Four point eight two feet per day. Feet per day. Mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, uh, feet per day. And, and I feel like for, for a, uh, a a silky fine sand um, like we have in in many of the places out here, I, I think. Uh, uh, I draw a conductivity of 2.8 would be more appropriate. So that converts to two inches an hour, which is very slow. Which is what? It's <coughs> slow. For, sir, I mean, I'm just thinking of a septic system. I mean, if you have 30, 30 minutes an inch, you have a large septic system. We've got clays out here, don't we? Okay, just another comment. Um, with, with regard to the, to the uh, infiltration basin, um, it, it sounds like most of the water that's going to be going into this basin is going to be infiltrating as opposed to going through and feeding the wetland. Again, you know, is, is that a concern or isn't it a concern? You know, you know better than me. Um, depending on the bedding of the soil in the infiltration basin, it, it's going to determine, you know, how much infiltrates as opposed to how much goes through and, and makes it into the air. And, just, just for your knowledge, you know, I know you were worried about the, the wetland area and, and not getting too much water into the wetland area. There's actually an outlet from the wetland area that comes out and it, it comes into Howard, uh, West Cross Road uh, to, the, to the storm drainage system. Oh, right. I forgot about that. There's like a head wall, isn't there? Yeah, on the back side. Yeah. The other question I had, and I think I said it earlier, I don't know if, it, if there's a way to distribute the water a little bit more you know, along the boundary of the, of the wetland area. Instead, of it, it's, it's almost like two point sources of water when it, when it does come through the pond. It's almost like two point sources of water coming through as opposed to what we have now, which is a, a flow like this. Um, in, the, in the latest uh, plan by the applicant, they indicate that, that they were going to uh, add compost 
to the existing material and mix it in together and, uh, and form the bedding. I, I don't know if that's what the plan is or not. But I but they were supposed to um, remove, to put in soils that has 2.41 inch per hour that was yeah, if, if you look at plan D1, uh, comment 5, it's kind of hard to see, but that's what's, what's in the plan. That's, um, that's directly from the stormwater management standards as well. Down in the bottom left corner. It's a lot of no fives in that case. Yeah, the very bottom. Infiltration basin construction. But again, if, if the soil in here is, is not permeable enough, it's going to allow water to go through more freely. And it's going to create standing water in the ponds, which <coughs> I don't know if we want standing water in the ponds. <coughs> so the last uh, comment that we had for, is, uh, for the uh, long-term operations and maintenance plan. Um, the last plan we saw was from the December 4th, 2018 uh, submittal. Um, we thought that uh, the level of effort on the town's part was going to be great to maintain it. And the estimated cost was <coughs> not very high. Um, as, as butters, we just need to know that the town is comfortable signing off on it, maintaining it. it, it it's a, looks like a lot of work. And, uh, you know, we're going to want to maintain it to, to try and keep more so, Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. And uh, just in regards to that one, can you mind, because this is a little bit of a chicken or the egg thing of planning versus com com issues. I mean, we obviously have concerns that we want to make sure the O and M can be maintained, but the sign off, the sign off from the town really <coughs> comes in the planning from the planning board, right? Or to, at, at those meetings from that? I, I, I don't know how. The engineering department will sign off on this uh, stormwater system. Okay. I, including anything that says, yeah, you're, yeah you guys are, this is what you guys are left with. Signing off on and, I think there's only a couple questions they need to look at. You know, the operation maintenance plan was one of them, but uh, this is pretty typical what we see yeah. around town. Okay. Um, if, I, if I may, just just again, the letter we got from the town engineer, like, I think it was literally one sentence saying everything's been addressed to that something to that effect. So I know it's a different commission, so I'm not trying to make, you know, imply anything here, but we certainly um, that was part of his package that he reviewed when he wrote that letter. So yeah. um, I think that implies he's pretty comfortable with the, with the system and what we proposed. Yeah. Um, and then just in line with um, what the, our, uh, Mr. Castelluccio had said, uh, I guess, you know, I, I think I know the answer to this, but the mounding calculation that you guys have done, um, I know they have been asking for a groundwater model, but it, the intent of this mounding calculation is to, in essence, this, this is the end point. This is where the water is going to flow. This is where it's, it's going to mound up and potentially change the, the groundwater for as a rise. I mean, the intent of that is to really capture where can it change. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I think it's that, that's part of it is yeah. to, to make sure that we're it's not having negative impacts on things like abutters. You know, it's also to make sure that just the pond functions in general and doesn't won't immediately fail and, and the sides will fail, things like that. So, yeah. But but yes, I mean, that that's part of the intent of that is to show that there's no negative impacts to, you know, other facilities, abutters, things like that. Yeah. Um, any any. Other questions from the commission based on that? Any other comments from the public? Hi, um, Suzanne Algeri, 149 Howard Street, um, Reading resident at this location for the last 22 years. Um, I just wanted to direct you to standard 2H, um, 
again, where it specifically um, notes that the people who are coming to a monthly for 149 Hill Street. I just wonder, um, I know the applicants have addressed this, and, and maybe it is satisfactory, but I wonder moving forward um, if there were alterations to um, the site based on who lives in there. How is that managed moving forward? I'm sorry, ask that again. So, so wondering moving forward, yep. you know, if this all goes through, uh, there's a concern for green water going into the property at 149 Howard Street, which is my property, uh, from lots, looks like one and two. So I know there's, a, there's swales that have been designated to go in there. And there's a mention within the report that if those swales get altered in the future, that that could then direct stormwater towards my house. So I'm wondering, how does that get managed moving forward? And well, so you have any uh, suggestions? Yeah. So, so a big component. Is, Janet, maybe you can explain this. Yeah, basically, are you this one forty nine? Yes. Yeah. So basically, there's a swale coming, taking runoff from this property. A swale here going to this infiltration basin one, which is just capturing some offsite runoff, as well as the swale coming here. To keep that maintaining, these you want to make sure that the swales don't get filled in. Whether this, this homeowner decides, oh, you know, I'm going to build a wall, and I'm, you know, whatever, however, what could change there? So the swale and the direction of the flow from this property and what's, and that this property also doesn't allow, because it's what's really kind of coming out this direction, that those swales are maintained in perpetuity. Yeah. That's the idea. So it's, it's kind of those, maybe, I don't know if you can deed. I don't know. No. Yeah. So, what's the best legal way to make sure that these homeowners don't change the swale on their property? You know, we see it often where you know, the new homeowner moves in, they want a nice flat area, and they, they change something. Now, a lot of times we're within the 100 foot area, and you know, generally they would have to come back to the commission. It, is this outside of the yeah. 100 yeah. foot? So, this isn't even something that. <coughs> The commission would be, oh, you know, that, that they would think, oh, I need to go to the conservation commission to report that. So, is there a, a mechanism to help protect and maintain those? It's similarly not a jurisdictional matter for the conservation commission not to change something out of its jurisdiction. So it's not something that you all can mandate, but respectfully, you're upgrading and. I think we remember from the site visit, there's a flow from somebody else's off-site broken drain that hopefully is going to be taken care of here. So you will have even less flow to worry about, as well as being upgraded, but that's not jurisdictional. Well, I, I would be careful there because if that is a big piece of the drainage of the entire system, mm -hmm. then it does impact what's part of our jurisdiction. I mean, if if you need everything to work, if you need that piece to work for the area that's within our jurisdiction to work, then it's an important it's an important piece and therefore is part of our concern. So I don't think you can just say, well, it's outside the 100, therefore you guys don't shouldn't be thinking I, about it. I think it. what I'm saying is if you were to try to look at everything that everybody might have a concern about, what if in the future it were to change, we're looking at this project, right? Yeah. We're no, looking I mean, at everything project. that this project I mean, is changing. Project. Well, we, do, we do have a piece of our uh, regulations that That's say if there, if there is something outside of our jurisdictional area that has the potential to impact the characteristics of our jurisdictional area, we do have a say over that. Yeah, mm -hmm. consider something like more likely than not. More right, than and not. this is definitely one of those situations. Yeah, yeah. and it's Here's typically stormwater issues when, when you're reaching beyond the 100-foot buffer. It's, it's typically in stormwater issues. Mm -hmm. So May I suggest a recommendation then? It, I don't think you legally can order don't change this swale, but you can warn 
um, you can put it into the order of conditions that everybody gets. It's already recommended. I'm assuming you're going to follow the, the suggestions of your third party consultant. <coughs> and that is that everybody receive a copy of this order. And you can put it in your special conditions, a noted recommendation that while that area is not jurisdictional, it has been noted as important to an abutter with respect to stormwater management. And um, to be aware of the dangers of altering that area if it were to increase the neighbor's concerns. That is a private matter that they can't direct their own stormwater into. That. Even though it's not your jurisdiction, you can put it in as a notation and a recommendation. I think what's part of your jurisdiction is not part of that. So that is definitely your jurisdiction. Yeah. But you, you can require an as built of the entire development and verify that those swales are installed as they're designed. Mm -hmm. um, so that would kind of hold it for the time being. And then basically, it is a notification to those property owners. It's, it's an ongoing OM. Item essentially that that is maintained. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it's hard. It's I mean, there's lots of stormwater features all over and <coughs> around that are being maintained. I mean, yeah. it's this whole green infrastructure. Yeah. It's a green infrastructure. Yep. And, and it's going to be, ch it, it's going to change. That's why the orders last three years. Is the wetlands in that area? I, I, it's not, they're not even wetlands, but I'd bet dimes to dollars. When that pipe that has been draining inappropriately from off site no longer does that, I'm betting that's not going to have any more flow to that area that, that you're worried about. Miss, I'm sorry. That was our concern name. all along was there was flow coming from somewhere and it needed to get directed in some, you know, and so this was the way it was getting directed. I'm looking at the letter we just got dated February 10th. And the Horsley River water. Yeah, page six, section H specifically says the commission may wish to include a special condition that states that the homeowners will not be allowed to alter these swales without approval from the commission. So that's what we're talking about, right? Right, right. So, that's what we're talking about. And then, it, and then and sometimes um, we engineers say things that may be not legally binding. So we want to make sure that it is, you know, it, it, whatever the mechanisms are, uh, that this commission is able to put in place. And because there will there not be a homeowner association, this is going to be individual homes. And they'll all get a copy of this. And that rec there's no objection to that recommendation. Chuck. If, if these swales are altered, we're changing the amount of water that's going to the wetland. Agreed. And, and I think one of the points that I, I think is very representative is that that's true for every project that we deal with when there's a stormwater feature created. Is the stormwater features cannot be altered. I mean, they're, they're, they're a big aspect of this. So the, the, the idea is making sure we can maintain them. Um, and, and I think what's What's important is what I just heard is special conditions, particularly for these houses that are, you know, not outside of the 100 foot, but really part of this jur jurisdiction, be part of that special, be included in that special condition. So. Are the swales part of the O&M plan? Yeah. 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 No, they're, they're not, they're not a um, designed stormwater treatment yeah. facility they're just great it's just grading so no but do you have individual ONM plans for the homeowners that will be managing their dry wells so we've looked at this as a whole but that's a fair point I mean, right so get, each homeowner should have their own <coughs> ONM for their dry wells Agreed. How do, any that have swales should also be included Agreed. how do they you know so each homeowner has an understanding of how they deal with features on their <coughs> <coughs> Any other comments? Here none. Uh, are there any other items that you guys have? For, any other questions from the, the commission here that, that we've 
gone through now that you've heard, or are there any other items that you guys have? Some question. Yeah. <clears throat> Do I have to state my name? No, you don't. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I'm wondering, and I know I'm coming into this project late, but I'm wondering with the green infrastructure that you looked at, did you also, and I don't know if this would make a difference, but um, permeable paving for this, this small road cul-de-sac, would that help um, bring the infiltration into that section of the property? So the, the if you're talking about the roadway in specific. Yeah, I guess we, it's a roadway. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so the intent of this is that it's accepted by the town and the town, well, I don't want to speak for the town, but my what I've been told is that they don't want permeable. It's just more to maintain. It's, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're supposed to specialize vacuum trucks and things like that. So um, they tend not to use that on a public way, and that's what the intent of this road is. Yeah. yeah. Is it possible for the commission to require the trees that are indicated here all along the edge, or is that also a town thing? Because I know the town also wants to have trees on the edge. Is, is it possible for the commission to require them or in a we condition? Trees. Those trees are um, uh, under the um, tree wardens review. Yeah. And specifically the ones that are going We don't go in that area. Yeah, yeah, these uh, ones. Yeah. So, it, it, so when we're counting trees for replacement for our tree policy, we don't take into consideration trees along the street. On the street, because that's separate. Because there's no control over whether they go in or not, what species they are, what they are. Okay. Just wanted to note that um, in the closing written rebuttal, I mean, uh, report, the um, last note that Janet makes is the abundance was provided a letter to the commission dated January 6, 2020. Several of the issues listed, but not all, have been addressed by the applicant in response to H.W. and the town engineer. H.W. recommends that the applicant respond to the abundance concerns in writing. I wonder if things stand on, on that. Yeah. Um, I, I think, and is it, you, you've received the, the comments, so... I know we've, we've had a, essentially this, right. the idea is we are sitting here in this public meeting. Um, Janet, I, I guess, do you see that you, you know, we, we were sitting going through the, the memo, do you feel there's additional value to having that in writing versus what's been talked about here in the public well, meeting? Well, I think um, that there was some comments that we have kind of addressed along the way. Yep. And as, I feel like the abundance of the good, well written letter, thoughtful, made it some really good points that they should make sure that their concerns have been addressed appropriately in some manner, whether it is in writing or it's here and it's discussed so that they feel like they've been heard. In, in regards to the tree cutting versus the proposed tree planting, where, where are those details? So, no. uh, C7 is the tree removal plan. So that uh, shows red X's on the trees that we've identified for removal. And uh, shows plantings as well. Do we have a total count? And these uh, are all. We're showing 24. <coughs> and these are. Six inch at DBH. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. And, and of, of course, in the field, if it's it's a one to one, is the intention here. Is that pretty much is is that basically the okay? It's it's the, all the symbols between on lot three and lot four between the graded area and the edge of property. Correct. And again, does not include the street trees. Those are separate. Um, do we have a list of the trees? Of what's proposed? Yeah. Uh, we don't provide it. Um, we've handled this a variety of ways with different communities, but mm -hmm. often it's um, either myself, the applicant, the contractor, whoever it is working with the agent to um, 
to provide <coughs> whatever is appropriate. Um, does the town have a list of preferential trees that, you know, if we, we can certainly work on it now if you want. I assume you want native. Yeah, Not I don't know if it's certain things. We have a native list. It sounds like you're leaving it open. Uh, I think this site's going to get an environmental monitor. <coughs> it would be something we'd leave in to just make sure, you know, it fits what's out there. Okay. Not bringing in new species. Sorry, I couldn't hear that, Chuck. An environmental monitor. Oh, an environmental monitor. And I, I thought she meant um, it's going to have it in the environmental oversight monitor, from an environmental monitor expected. to report to the commission at certain times. It's big enough, and we've done this in the past for these projects. Um, and if that's left open, I mean, typically we would go out and right. find a spot. So yeah, that's, right. that's not a problem with those two things happening. Right. And kind of tied in with that, I mean, these are shown as representative. The intent of this plan is to show that we're replacing trees one to one, not yeah. that that's the spot where a tree's going, you know, things like that. That would be worked through with, um, I assume, Chuck and the field. And, and what caliper are you replacing? Does that left open to? No, I think that would, again, be in line with town standards. All right, so we'll just use that tree policy. We'll use the tree policy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's three-inch caliper. Yeah. Would it be all right if I reviewed what I think you're expecting? I think that's a good idea because I've got it written down too. We can compare our notes. Oh no, please, you go. You're so, in charge. So I think what I've, I'm hearing is you know, we, we've had a lot of discussion at this point. You know, I think um, you know, I welcome the other commissioners to speak up, but I feel pretty comfortable with the stormwater at this point. You know, I think Orsley and Witten's done a, a good job for us and, and has represented us well here certainly beyond our technical capabilities. Um, what I've heard going through as kind of a list of items that we'd like to make sure we see is there was a retaining wall that was you know, just clipping the edge of the 35-foot zone. I think you indicated you could probably get that out. Um, similarly, two there's two of them. Um, similarly, at the cul-de-sac, we've got a slope at the end um, that's it, in excess, yeah, probably in excess of the three to one. Um, and in addition, you know, there's for protection of, I think Chuck had talked to you about uh, snow issues and somebody just taking a plow and going right over the edge, which is down here. I think if there's a retaining wall there, Chuck, you're, you're thinking we're going to resolve that? Leaving it open just to have some suggestions. Something there to protect. Um, so, both something that I think double duty there, right? Mm -hmm. Slope. And protection from somebody just plowing right into the sure. snow, right into the well. And um, I'm hearing making sure we have an O and M for each homeowner, um, and uh, a pilot, something that's going to somewhat be left open. But we've got the count for is you. Know, there's a replacement plan, but you guys are going to meet the tree plan. This is just going to be have to be in a condition, Chuck. Uh, but a tree policy is uh, that they're going to have to meet the tree policy based on the quantities. And I think you wanted your O and M letter um, approved from the town engineer. Correct. Some sort of detention basin control. Yeah. A proposed. Yeah. So high, maybe you know, not. Maybe not the drains, but um, Andy, you, you were talking about. Possibly at some sort of pipe with a valve. Oh, you know, are you talking about the under drain? Yeah, the yeah, under yeah, drain. Yeah, we can, we can do that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's, we've done that Thank many you. times. Yeah. 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 A little level of control. Any other items? May I ask since it's my uh, Hold on one sec. Go ahead, ma'am. Joanne Rivera with West Park Road. Yep. I feel as though the topic switched and we didn't get an answer to our question. Um, having a written statement in response to the concerns that the others have. I feel like, yes, maybe things were discussed, but we all know when something is in writing, it is much better than when it's just commentary. So we'll just do it. I, yeah. I think well, yeah. that's fair. I, I think I think I'm fine with you. Know, if and you guys, if you guys could prepare some sort of response to the, the letter, I mean. Um, We'll do it, but I'd like to ask respectfully, the next time if the buyers are going to write a letter, please send it to us. We didn't even see this letter. I thought we addressed it. We didn't get this letter until today. 
Okay. Well, so I still like that it's sent to the commission. We will make enough to make sure you guys get it. Mm -hmm. additional clarification on um, the plan moving forward. I understand that each individual homeowner will receive the O and M, but what does that mean moving forward? What happens to the swales? How are they supposed to be maintained? What do I do in the future if there's issues? So the swales are going to be part of really the, this drainage structure. So with this attached to this is this O and M is uh, indication that these are these the special condition that these are required. Uh, if something were to happen, you know, certainly you know, we don't have eyes on, around the clock, but if something were to happen, it would have to be fixed and maintained. Um, unfortunately, you know, homeowners do things without, you know, we, we certainly are not the policing every property that right. we've ever seen. And unfortunately, that's true with every single drainage aspect that we've got on this project or on any other project. If somebody decided to stop maintaining one of their their outfalls, one of the, the you know, this is why we have <laughs> and this is why we need to understand what these features are for. Um, so, so just to be clear, that operations and maintenance requirement is written into the order of conditions for this permit, and those order of conditions are um, attached to, are registered to the deeds. So it's up to every homeowner to read your deed and make sure you know what's in it. So. Yeah. Thank you, Anika. Yep. All right. Are there any other items for the, from the commission? May I ask the question? There's some we didn't hear anything at all from. Is there anything on your minds? Any unknown? My clients have been slogging through this as long as many of you. And you've already hired, uh, oh, well, actually paid for, but you have a third party consultant. Is there anything left? Some of you are new. Is there anything on your mind that you didn't say? Right? Yeah. Do I hear a motion? I think we've got a list of items that still need to be addressed. I um, move to continue. Do I hear a second? Okay. All those in favor? What is that? What's that? What is that continuation date? So our next meeting would be 28th? Twenty-six. Twenty-six of February. February. Yeah. Is that is that enough time for you to get it in? And if uh, the town engineer be asked to have the O and M letter by then? Our our request is going to be to close the. Carrying that date, so I want to make sure the town engineer knows that. Mm. Thank you. I think that's fair. I, what I see is this this project is starting to be in a good spot, and there's items that still need to be addressed. But, um, so I'll ask the vote again. All those in favor uh, for Asso continuing? Associate members are not to vote. Oh, yeah. very good. That's <laughs> who are so all right. Thank you. <laughs> Associate members are one, two, and three. Yeah. Thank you. All those in favor? <laughs> All right. That's a new thing. <laughs> Thank you for your service Thank and your you. time. I hope you don't regret it, everyone. Thank you, Andy. Chair. Thank you. Thank you for the next meeting. We, we've never had an associate member. I should introduce myself. I go by Andy. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take five minute recess before we start the next next hearing. <coughs> Go ahead, hit the gavel.
We do. We actually have a waterfront division. They're actually GEI. All all at the same time. So I'll call back to order the the meeting. Okay. Let's start with the rendering. I'm sorry, Chuck. Did we bounce out of there? So just give me a second. Um, Chuck, this is before I do that. We want to before we get to to you quickly here. Sorry. Uh, the second item on our agenda. I realized that this that was a a long first. Hearing, so I, I appreciate you guys uh, hanging in there with us. Okay, <laughs> uh, 364 Lowell Street. Um, the oh. applicant has indicated they'd like to continue. Um, can I just get a motion? I make a motion to continue 364 Lowell Street until February 26th. Second, all those in favor? Thank you. All right, so now we'd like to uh, continue the public hearing for a notice of intent. 0727 uh, for 259 267 Main Street. Uh, we'll let the applicant present the, the project. Um, I'll just introduce the commission starting on my left. Uh, Chuck Taroni, Conservation Administrator. Scott Keith. Michael Lemonberg. Tay Evans Rhodes. Carl Sacconi. Michael Flynn, Chair. Anika Scanlon, Vice Chair. Martha Moore. John Sullivan. David Pennett. I said this earlier, but there's a sign in sheet. Anybody hasn't signed in, please just make sure you sign. Your show. Thank you, everybody. Um, for the record, my name is David Cowell. I'm a senior weather scientist from Hancock Associates here tonight on behalf of the applicant, Stonegate Development. Um, this is our second public hearing, but um, as I understand from our prior hearing, that there's been some turnover, um, a change of um, um, some commission <laughs> So we're going to approach this as, as though it were an opening hearing. 
Um, what I'm going to try to do, we, we have some complexities involved in our project. I'll try to uh, balance, um, give you guys some, some detail and information on our project, um, trying to balance brevity as well and, and try to get you guys out of here before we um, I'd like to introduce some other members of our project team who I'll do most of the talking, but we also have uh, Josh Latham. Uh, Latham, is it pronounced right? Uh, legal counsel. We have uh, Eric Cates, uh, is the um, a principal with Stonegate, our, our applicant. And we have Rainy Gagnon, um, is a, a civil engineer with Hancock Associates, responsible for site design and uh, stormwater um, design of this project. So we did have an opening hearing on this. Um, that was some time ago. Since our opening hearing, we've had um, a lot of interagency co or interdepartmental coordination with other municipal departments here uh, in, in the town of Reading. Um, and our plan before you tonight is our, our third revised plan. So this has changed twice um, under submittal since our, our initial um, opening hearing. Um, let me give you uh, the Reader's Digest summary of existing conditions on site and what it is we're proposing. Um, Chuck, can you touch, uh, this is the existing conditions plan. So this is, um, uh, there's two lots here that will be uh, combined into one. There's one large lot and there's a second triangular lot here. Um, this lot uh, is vacant. Um, it's heavily degraded. This was uh, previously the site of a, um, uh, a commercial oil uh, business. Um, this site over here was the site of, uh, there was a single family house that was condemned and, and raised uh, or, or demolished shortly before our acquisition of the property. And the of this property. One of the resource areas on site. On the, this is Main Street here. On the back side, there is a perennial stream that runs, uh, that sort of abuts our property boundary on the outside. Um, from the perennial stream, it broadcasts 200 foot riverfront area. This line represents the 100 foot inner riparian zone, and the 200 foot riverfront area is um, a lot of lines in the plan. It's uh, out here. Uh, that's the 200 foot riverfront area. Um, there is also boarding vegetated wetland. Um, this entire area here, demarcated in here, is boarding vegetated wetland. Importantly, the boarding vegetated wetland um, comes up onto this lot and, and doubles back. So there's there's a projection of, of wetland that comes out towards Main Street in this area. Um, and subsequently, we have the 35-foot uh, notice third zone under local bylaw and 100-foot buffer zone associated with that wetland resource area. Um, we characterize this lot as um, it, it's. It's very degraded. The, the wetlands are uh, marginal in context. They're on the, um, what's called the marginal fringe between wetland and upland. It's uh, not, uh, not a screaming cattail march. This is um, uh, just, just makes the grade in terms of hydric soils and wetland vegetation out here. Um, there is, uh, there's a, a lot of invasive species out here. Um, we have a, the major issues out here are Asiatic bittersweet and Norway maple are prevalent throughout the site. Um, and that's it on, on uh, the existing conditions, uh, unless you guys have any questions on, on the site. Now let's move on to our development. Um, let's do the, uh, and then let's move on to creating and drainage. All right, that's, this is it. So I'll jump right into uh, impact areas and why we're before you with the notice of intent. Um, we have uh, proposed um, a three-story, 24-unit um, uh, condominium complex out here. Um, in order to some of the some of the site constraints that we have on site is that there's a zoning um, restriction that runs uh, um, towards maybe like the first one third of the site is zoned. Um, that's the zone residential, and then it's zoned business the front, district. Along Main Street is the A40 district. Yep. Thank and you, Josh. And then in the rear portion of the site, really encompassing most of the wetland, is the S14 district. And there's a sliver, which is business A district. So we have three different zoning districts intermeshed in this. Right. One of the things that this zoning, uh, that the zoning restriction does is actually, to the benefit of the wetlands, pushes all of our development as close to Main Street as we possibly can, can, can get to maximize our frontage um, on the part of Main Street. <coughs> As proposed, um, we are proposing um, 
some uh, alteration, permanent alteration within uh, BVW. And we've um, uh, had pre-filing consultation with the, the town before we came in with the submittal an appraisal of whether or not there exists enough opportunity on site to provide enough compensatory mitigation to offset our, our impacts and, and, and justify these disturbances in, in request for um, waiver from the 35 foot um, no disturb zone for a portion of our work and to fill a portion of that finger like uh, projection of wetland that actually comes up. Uh, the, the budding property is another uh, apartment complex here um, and the wetland falls, falls in here. The impact area would be this corner of the building would fill uh, 2,700 square feet of boarding vegetated wetland. And by necessity, the 35 foot uh, uh, zone. We, carried it, we, we provided an impact uh, um, ass assessment uh, calculating all these impacts and for the mitigation of these sites. This is the, as I said, this is the third, third revision of uh, our plan at this point. Um, our mitigation strategy remains unchanged from the, the one that we had, uh, submitted initially on. Um, for the uh, fill of 2,700 square foot of wetland, we're proposing when we, oh, th th there are, have been some changes. On our initial filing, we have proposed one-to-one -one wetland replication uh, based on comment from received from the Conservation Commission and asked if we had opportunity to bump that up to two-to-one ratio mitigation, which we have. Um, Chuck, do you mind uh, flipping forward to the, scroll down, oh, this is it. Yep, wetland restoration replication. So again, for our impact area in here, we're proposing um, 2,700 square feet of wetland replication here. Um, this is actually a prime location uh, in the sense that this is a, a peninsula of fill that's heavily mounted. It's been at the, um, not only to create wetland replication in here, but subsequently remove that, that, that fill from that area. That's something that the commission early on has said that it's, it's twofold to create wetland there and get that urban fill out there. And this is just strife with, uh, this is almost monocultural northern maple and Asiatic bittersweet. There's really no other vegetation on that, that mountain that would come up. Our second wetland replication area would be um, uh, further across the site. Um, and this is another uh, 2,700 square foot. Um, to, to bring us the two to one wetland uh, mitigation. As mitigation for allowances to uh, um, permanent disturbances within the 35 foot no disturb zone. Sorry, somewhere buried in here, I did have an impact uh, calculation table. So we had proposed um, it was. 3,000 square feet of, of temporary <coughs> alteration and 7,800 square feet of permanent alteration within the no disturb zone. But this, this hatched area here, um, all throughout this area, represents um, what we're proposing as uh, compensatory mitigation. And this is the graded area of 35 foot no disturb zone. Um, and this is a total of uh, exceedance of 18,000 square feet. So that's, uh, that's more, more than two to one. It's closer to two and a half. Yes, Annika. Yeah, I'm um, just going to, I was following you, but then I missed something earlier. So I'm just going to ask a quick question. Oh, sure, yeah. Anything um, I can do for So me? in terms of um, the wetland area proposed to be filled, what's the total square feet of all wetlands proposed to be okay. filled? So that's just it. So we have, we're carrying, uh, it's 2,000 square feet of temporary impact. Now, temporary impacts would be this this area here is a temporary impact, which is um, we're proposing. Uh, In other words, outside of that fence is yeah, temporary outside of the impact. Water <coughs> water. So what is inside of that fence? The permanent alteration is 2,750 square feet. Is there, I mean, if there's anything uh, in particular here? I think, I, so I was just doing, I was just doing sort of a scaled, like, off my um, own scale I wouldn't scale by 11. 11 by 17s are not the scale. Oh, no, um, no, I know. But the scale bar was there. You know. Yep. Okay. This is, this is calculated in AutoCAD. Okay. So that's our, our surface area disturbance, uh, permanent alterations, uh, 2,750 square feet. Um, so 
so let me get back what I was proposing for uh, um, proposed mitigation for disturbances in the 35 foot uh, no disturb zone would be wholesale um, restoration of the 35 foot no disturb zone totaling um, 18,500 square feet which is about two, two and a half uh, to one ratio. Um, these areas are also highly degraded with, um, um, there's some uh, erosion control problems on some of the slopes in here. And uh, again, it's just rife with uh, invasive species. The, the Norway maple and um, Asiatic bittersweet have almost created like a monocultural um, stand where there's really low uh, species diversity in terms of vegetation beneath that. Um, <laughs> our proposal would be to um, remove invasive species throughout this area. There was some discussion on prior um, um, uh, hearings on this in terms of the merit of, of taking mature Norway maples in terms of its tree clearing, but at the same time, they're invasive species. What we have done since the, the initial hearing that we had, we were asked to provide a quantitative analysis of um, trees that we were proposing to cut based on um, size, diameter, breast height, and species. And uh, in accordance with your performance standards, um, uh, I understood that uh, we needed to provide no less than one-to-one -one ratio um, replacement of tree-to-tree -tree for every tree taken to plant a tree or two-to-one ratio mitigation of shrubs, uh, that being two shrubs per one tree. And that was in our, our, one of our submittal applications was a demonstration with compliance in that regard. And we're, we're well in exceedance of that. We're, we're and then our third. David, can I just stop? Oh, yeah, Dave, please. Are you going to remove all of the Norway maple from the site? No, side? no, it's going to be slough cut. And it's not to the extent, actually, it's very important to point out that um, where we have our wetland, uh, uh, our wetland flags, um, ours, we, we have a, 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 there was a S approximated uh, tree line uh, on the plans. That is not accurate. Chuck's walked the site with us a few times uh, in, in actually getting out there. Our wetland flags, there's maybe, you know, it's what it is is the area, the area in here is not really mature trees as much as it's, um, it was historically graded and leveled and it's fallen fallow. And now it's mostly like mugwort, um, uh, um, uh, hey, what is hay fever? It's, uh, what is the plant? Ragweed. Ragweed, thank you very much. <laughs> Rag, ragweed, mugwort, and a lot of, uh, these are uh, considered, uh, not, not necessarily invasive species, but noxious weeds and provide very little habitat for them. Um, so our proposed uh, um, restoration plan uh, carries a planting schedule for um, shrubs and herbaceous species to, to plant throughout this area. So, as part of your regrading here, are you going to take away all of the, I mean, there's a lot of ground macadam and different things like that, axles and concrete and that. Are you going to remove all of that or are you only going to a certain point as part of the project? Oh, anywhere, I mean, where there's, we're not proposing, outside of our limit of, 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 of work activity where we have proposed grading and outside of actual removal of fill from this area, um, we will plan to remove anything superficial or, or surficial at the surface. So there are, you know, there's like an old uh, 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 rusty bed frame out here. And if we find tires or, as you implied, any, uh, I think we found a couple of old uh, drums that were out there, any of that material would come up. We're not planning on excavating down to remove anything that's, that's earth, earth disturbance to excavate. But anything at the surface, yes, yes, any, any residual waste or or, yeah, deleterious material that's out there. That's I, I guess my question was, I didn't know whether you were kind of drawing a line as to a tree line there, and it's like if there's a big clump of macadam that's over that tree line, well, that's going to stay. What is macadam? I'm sorry. for uh, Asphalt. Oh, asphalt. Okay. I'd it's, never heard the term macadam. Yeah. yeah. No, oh, yeah, if there's any, yep, yeah, this is, yeah, the proposal is for anything. First of all, I, I don't believe there is any um, um, asphalt beyond, beyond this area. If there is, yes, our, our planting plan calls for um, surficial treatment to um, ensure that there's uh, that this is loamed um, with uh, screened organic loam, clean material, um, to provide a suitable growing substrate at the surface. So yeah, that would include any surficial um, um, impervious surfaces. 
But based on our survey, I, I don't believe there is any um, old, old asphalt. It was great. I mean, you could tell there's maybe some gravel base that was down where they had, had leveled this area. Um, and we would, uh, you know, tell that to ensure that there's um, organic substrate for growing plants. Any other questions? Just say a few comments. Just oh, to kind of give you more yep. of a, a wholesale perspective of the property. Um, historically, you probably know this site. You're driving uh, north on Hill Street. You're going to see this on your right. Um, on this side, you're going to have the Belmont Arms condominium. On this side, you're going to have the Avon House condominium. As we mentioned, this is an 840 district. So going back to the 60s, the town has identified this location very specifically, this property in Belmont Arms condominium property for apartment multifamily type. Now certainly it only goes a certain distance from the center line of Main Street. So that imposes some complications as to how far we can go without then causing variance issues and a much more complicated project. <clears throat> the wetlands aspect, I think calling it a degraded, si degraded site is probably almost a misnomer. It's been a pretty abused site. Um, it's been used probably since the 30s uh, for a residential oil delivery business. Now obviously going back to the 30s, there was no zoning. Folks did what they wanted to do. There was farming use all back here before that. We actually have aerial photographs showing how well torn up this site was. As recent as just a couple years ago, if you walk this site, you'll see that all the way back here, it's just been leveled. There's been gravel dust. There used to be heavy trucks all parked all through here. The residential house was the family that ran the business, so it was really a central location. The wetland that we're talking about potentially filling I wouldn't say it's a high-value BBW. I mean, the owner that, that's actually that lives there, that's where they play. They actually park cars there occasionally. Like, it was really just part of the yard for this single family house. When they tore it down a few years ago, I think it's probably starting to come back. But it, it really has been. It's so close to, the, to Main Street, it's just been a pretty well-trodden area. So I just want to make sure that, you know, as we look at this, you know, filling wetlands is obviously the last thing we want to do. In this case, it's a very different situation. I just want to give a little context to that. Uh, but if you have any questions about the history of the site and any other uh, procedural steps, certainly let us know. Thank you. I think it's worth noting to the, the newer members. So we've actually done, uh, the commission's done a site visit here. And, uh, for what it's worth, I would tend to agree with that statement that the finger area that we're talking about, uh, there's old foundations in there, there's old, uh, but it, it's, it's tough to make out as this is a wetland providing true value, but, but it meets the definition of a wetland. Um, and so in general, I've been in favor of, of if there's improvements to that can occur in the areas that have value, the, the ramp, um, the, that's where we want to focus. That's where we want to improve the wetland habitat, the wetland area, um, rather than trying to preserve some finger that is you know, questionably providing value. Um, so that's at least in my perspective, I won't speak for any of the other commissioners, but we've, we've done site visits here. <laughs> this has come before us both when you first presented the project and when you were first, first starting to look at it, and we had done some site visits. So it's worth understanding what that finger is. Um, so. Yeah, that, that really provides context. Uh, thank you, Michael and Josh. Thank you for, for speaking up on that. Yeah, on our existing conditions plan, there's an area where the, the uh, old home foundation was. There's still um, um, footings and uh, fireplace that's, that's actually in the wetland proper. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's degraded. And I'm glad that you uh, agreed that I think the opportunity for mitigation really outweighs the, the consequences of doing that. And that, that gets a little bit ahead to my presentation of I wanted to spend a little bit of time on our impact area analysis and our, our alternatives analysis, which which has us where we are. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to speak to that. The third, before I move on, the third part of our, our mitigated strategy was that we had proposed uh, um, uh, just above the banks in the first five feet of BBW, uh, away from the perennial stream up here, um, there's uh, additional opportunity to um, remove some invasive species uh, along that just to provide um, a, a bit more vegetative buffer in the riparian corridor along the stream. Um, I didn't, uh, I failed to mention in the existing additions that 
the um, town of Reading, uh, DPW, owns and maintains an easement along the back of the property uh, where there's a, um, I forget the diameter, 30-inch sewer line that uh, runs through there. Um, in this area, it's actually, um, they do vegetative maintenance on this to allow access. And it's it's not manicured grass, but it's cropped very short, uh, you know, um, stubble, and um, it, it looks like a fairway through there. This was another opportunity just to um, remove some invasive species uh, above the bank and um, install some uh, additional um, native shrubs, uh, providing um, sort of a vegetative buffer in what would be considered a riparian corridor, and some um, uh, native seedlings application as well. So that is the um, Reader's Digest version of our, our restoration plan in the past. Um, I did want to move on. Uh, oh, please. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Are there special considerations for the commission with regards to the contaminants that are most likely in the ground, given its prior uses, that are you know, part of something that's, that we, that's already been discussed? It's a good question. <laughs> We've done a phase one, phase two environmental site analysis uh, with borings and provided a copy of that. Um, and we didn't find any contaminants uh, in exceedance of threshold levels. Yes. Um, correct. Do you have a phase two? I see the phase one. I went through the phase one report. Yeah, we did, gave you, Chuck, we gave you phase one and phase two. Yeah, phase two. you did find coal um, and PAHs. Above or below? Above um, RCs, above reportables um, yep. at SB 104. 104. And it might be reportable. Um, and it's probably because of the coal. Okay. Um, That's above my pay grade. We're getting into, we don't have an LSP represented yet with us uh, this evening. So with we'd be, the film we'd material, be happy to go back and look at that. That's uh, just a suggestion. Might wanna <coughs> might wanna take a look at that, especially with history of buried, you know, the extensive history as sure. an oil as an oil facility. Yep. <coughs> But no, and, that was, and that was in review of the phase one, not the phase two, or do you? Uh, the want, phase one. You make sure you can have the phase two. Phase one from May 2019. Yep. Um, and if they did sampling, that's they, they said right. there was an exemption because of coal. However, the, the nuances of that exemption. Um, is that under the MCP? You might want to get a couple opinions on what that. that under? Sorry. What is, what is the exemption under? Is that the MCP? Um, so I don't want I don't want to go into another regulation. <laughs> Besides the Wetland Protection Act, but yep. um, um, there is there is a, a a coal ash exemption under the hazardous waste regs. However, it needs to be kind of proven as kind of minor and not yeah. not not widespread filling. Okay. Do you know what I mean? So, and yep. it kind of depends on which LSP you talk to. You need to get a couple of opinions from. Yep. From. Sure. Yeah. You know, no. But from a regulatory context, I mean, we're talking about the yeah, MCP or CERCLA. Yeah. Yeah. But the so so ransom. So the the phase one said it was exempt. I, I'm not 100 percent convinced. Okay. It is above reportable concentrations for residential yeah. soil. There's other evidence of if there's drum or metal debris or anything else. You know, sure. it might be worth sort of protecting yourself and for the sake of going forward. Okay. Just get it. How do you, I, what's, uh, what's being proposed or what, what action should we take? Um, we'll look into it. Oh, yeah. Talk, talk to an LSP. So, yeah. Talk, yeah. talk, so, talk, so talk to an LSP. Uh, they I'll, the they'll, they they'll, they'll make, make recommendations. Right in, in their, uh, they'll make recommendations. Right I don't, I'm not an LSP. Office. I don't want to, I don't want to go there. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yes, Martha. I just have a question about, um, you're talking about um, putting in all these wetland species along the cross-hatched area, yes. but the um, the wetland area between there and the stream is still going to all be Norway maple and bittersweet. Is there any way of um, preventing those invasive species from just coming back and wiping out all your new little blueberries and things? Yep. So what's what's often um, what's often conditioned in restoration plans is uh, two to three years of monitoring and two to three years of uh, invasive species management prior to issuance of a certificate of compliance, and we would expect something like that would be conditioned here, where once we do our invasive species treatment, remove um, Asiatic bittersweet, um, we have decided based on feedback that we're going to do select cut of trees and not clear cut, and we provided that that tree inventory. Um, is that will. 
you're absolutely right. It's impossible for us to say that we will eradicate invasive species on site. Yeah. We can do our best to treat it and, and manage it. Um, and typically outside of a two or three year time frame prior to certificate of compliance, we would go in there and um, uh, perform monitoring reports to A, make sure that our, our uh, nursery stock plants are still viable and still growing, uh, check on their health and vitality, and do additional invasive species um, um, removals as you know the seed stock is still in the soil. Um, I think we actually had carried uh, a, a proposal to strip like the top layer um, to get some of that seed stock out of there and, and put some loam down on top of that. Um, so during that period, uh, it it helps establish the, the native shrubs that you're going in and, and, and head starts them to really establish to, because as, as you may know, invasive species are, um, one of their attributes is that they're um, uh, pioneering um, uh, species that are really well suited for disturbance. And that disturbance is really a time that, in, that allows invasive species to come in. So that's, we propose to treat it for a period of two or three years to head start all the other plants. Okay, thanks. Sure. Can I ask one other question? Yeah, sure. Um, regarding please. the planting um, in the wetland replication area, I think yep. that's, is that on, is that sort of detailed on one uh, of the sheets, I think? Yep. C6. It's a really amazing list of C6. C6. Yeah. Carl. I gotta keep trying to Carl, how's that yeah. look? Did yes, you look at that? I have them. Any uh, comments on yep. the this is, this is our, replication? No, I, he was well, uh, my, yeah, my question was it was easy to follow and easy to read, and I think that's it. Do we need do we need a site plan kind of roughly showing where the plantings are going to happen, or does it matter? That's one. Of the, that, that's worth talking about. So, <laughs> as I'm, I'm a bit opposed to that in the sense that unlike conventional landscaping plants that actually detail you're going to plant six arborvitae here and you're going to plant five here, is this this on all purposes is going to be naturalized. So what I do is I carry plant values based on a density of plants that I'd like to see in an area. So in this case, I calculated uh, shrubs based on uh, six foot uh, planting off centers for shrubs to fill an area, mm -hmm. and then um, seed mix and herbaceous species to, to plant herbaceous species around there to fill gaps, and then application of a conservation native um, wildflowers, or not a wildflowers, the yeah, New England conservation seed mix. And what that allows us to do is that, that looks like yep, one of the conditions that I would <coughs> propose is that an e ecological consultant such as myself would monitor the landscape contractor as they're out there doing this. Yeah. And that affords opportunity to microsite plants based on once the disturbance comes up, based on their, um, if they're facultative wet or facultative, facultative up, you can, I can actually look on the ground and say, this would be a great place to put some uh, sweet pepper bush. I think that they're going to fare pretty well in the soils here with this uh, hydrology here. This area is a little dry. Let's move into some uh, um, chestnut or hazelnut, uh, which I think fair well here. Well, and I, the way one comment was the the grading behind. So if you enter from the main entrance, you take the first right. Uh, yep. Around off of that pavement there, there's. Me, I'm just going to come out to you. So, so there's five feet of thing. Ninety-four. 89. So that embankment, I just, oh, and I see you have the dogwoods in there, right? On this point. Yes, that that's, was, this is where we segue into uh, a, a conventional planting landscaping schedule. That's Yeah, so on that embankment, I just didn't know, if, I know it's probably, you know, Three one slope, but if any of that run over the planting would take in the hillside. But also this hatched. Just to make sure that that's like if you're going to sure. observe that, like they're planting properly in the hillside there. Yep. Because I just sometimes on the steep on a bank like that. Oh, absolutely. Okay, all right. I understand the context of your question. Yes, yes. Um, I've seen. I've 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 recently done a um, uh, executed a um, restoration planting in the pond. And we had just had, we had a, um, a, a steep gradient two to one slope that we were supposed to put shrubs in, and um, they actually fared very well. Um, that was a concern of ours, whether or not before that's actually stabilized. So what my, my recommendation would be, and this wasn't the case in Concord, and this was my concern, was that we wait until we get um, uh, like herbaceous cover on there, like a grass seed mix, yeah. to stabilize the slopes with root structure yeah. prior to... to boring holes and throwing shrubs and trees along there um, under the risk that if it wasn't stabilized, as, as my site in Concord was, they, they wanted to get this. They, 
they wanted to get done and not wait for their um, grass to grow. So, and the commission agreed. They said, go ahead and put the, I mean, you're, you're accountable if this, this collapses on you. Um, and and I, in the, the planting there, was that a comment from the public about the headlights, right? From oh, the, from the, the, the previous, previous uh, abutter that was concerned right. about um, his uh, view shed. We did some site walks. Um, we haven't uh, responded directly to him. I don't know if he's uh, in the audience tonight. Um, when we get to public comments, we can certainly address that. You have a plan, metric plan. Don't What's you that? Have, you have a lighting plan. We do have, yeah. That shows. Oh, was it lighting or tree removal? The I'm sorry. The concern was the concern for the abutter across the wetland was uh, car, the car headlights. Well, plan so, metric plan is not going to happen. That's right. not going to change. My, my only that. comment was if those are deciduous shrubs, they, it seems like that would create a hedge to me, but an evergreen, like even the English yew or something, I don't know if it's some shade over there. Well, that's, we'll that's a, yeah, we looked at, based on, based on, first of all, dialing it back significantly on, on um, uh, tree, cutting and tree removal in there. Um, this is going to be, there's really going to be no reduction. If anything, there's going to be more vegetative cover because the area of the 35 foot disturbed zone, which is now mugwort, is all going to be higher shrubs and, and things of that nature, growing to heights of 12, 12, 15 feet in height instead of mugwort, which is, uh, when, when it gets going, it's my height, five, six feet. But the shrubs are evergreen. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> so. Any other questions on uh, restoration? So I did want to segue into um, uh, how we got to our, our revision three. We've had several uh, comments and um, uh, from fire department and meetings with CD, uh, with CD, CDPC, CBDC. CBDC. Thank you. I'll never get it right. I'll, I'll say ACDC or something. Um, inter interdepartment coordination. Things like uh, initially we hadn't proposed a uh, cul-de-sac here, uh, or I'm sorry, turn around. This this was uh, mandated by the fire department to provide uh, emergency vehicle access to come in and out of there. Um, and I did want to move on to we received some mass DEP comments on our revision two, and I'd like to focus on that and our response to mass DEP's comments and some of the the changes that we've made to in response to their comments to get us to revision three, which we feel is a viable project. Okay. So, comments received from MassDP. First, they said that um, it was a um, it was a non permittable project as designed, and there were uh, really um, three criteria that they had asked us to vet. Um, one is for our proposed impacts within this line right here is the wetland line where we're proposing fill with the building, and they said that they didn't feel that um, our, our alternatives analysis uh, really vetted this to the context of our efforts to avoid, minimize, and mitigate. And of course, the, the, the immediate question is, why can't we reduce the footprint of building to vacate that area and make the building smaller? In an alternatives analysis, um, well, first of all, we in our initial alternatives analysis, we covered site constraints that push us into the configuration we have based on zoning setbacks on edge of the property, frontage in the front, zoning setback here. For this to remain a viable project, economic analysis is a part of uh, and alternatives analysis that's recognized in, in the regulations for Mass DEP. And this, if we did any reduction of this building, this is a, a 24 unit um, uh, building. Any reduction, the way that these are configured in, in, in a three story building, is that there's two units on each side in, in you know, three stories, that's, that's six units. If we were to reduce the footprint of this building at all, it would take us from, was I saying, oh, it was 24 units down to 18. It was 18, no, it's six, it's 18. minus six, because there's, there's two units stuck on three. 24 to 18, that's minus six, that's fast math, right? <laughs> it, would, it would render the project economically infeasible. And we stated that in our initial analysis, but um, in DEP's context of, of, of can you demonstrate that, we performed, uh, we gave you guys a quantitative economic uh, uh, assessment. And we'll say from developers, that's like pulling teeth to you know, disclose uh, what they are. But any, any reduction here would be, represent the loss of six units. It would represent, um, I think it was $3.6 million in, in, in loss in the profit uh, percent margins on this would go from 16.8% down to 1.5, which is, 
it just it, it would kill the project. We'd, we'd vacate um, um, this proposal. Now, in evaluation of, uh, they specifically asked us to speak to uh, 10 point, uh, 310 CMR 10.55 or 54 uh, section 4, which is the performance standards for fill within BVW. It's at the conservation's discretion to permit fill um, not to exceed 5,000 square feet, provided that we meet performance standards for um, uh, replication and, and mitigation, which we've had. The, the basic state standard is one-to-one -one wetland replication for uh, uh, per square foot of fill. And we've doubled that uh, based on the conservation's uh, comments to carry uh, two-to-one wetland replication in addition to um, buffer zone um, uh, restoration work as well. Um, they also uh, state that you need to evaluate the um, evaluate the net benefits and really look at there's there's eight interests for wetlands protection under the Wetlands Protection Act and that includes wildlife habitat, fisheries habitat, stormwater protection, flood attenuation, pollutant attenuation, uh, groundwater recharge, and uh, it, Systematically, we provided on our response an evaluation of each of the, the interests for wetland protection um, under those interests. And I, I feel that uh, that we've, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to, I don't want to keep you guys here all night. I can speak to each of those different points um, at your discretion. But I, I read your response letter. I thought it okay. was fairly thorough. Yep. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions pertaining to that, the, the, the second... Um, the second reason that this wasn't permittable as previously designed was we had previously proposed a, um, a, a detention basin with a spillway located here on the property. Um, we are prohibited from uh, surface discharges to a zone of surface water protection. So uh, Rainey, by uh, working his magic, was able to um, uh, pull uh, away from the zone of surface water protection with our detention basin, and we've added um, infiltration um, into the ground that, that meets our stormwater management standards. We provided a revised stormwater management report with our last submittal dated uh, January 28th or 9th, um, along with our site plan that, that, that goes with it. So we've demonstrated that we can meet the stormwater uh, management standards by vacating the surface discharge to zone A and putting everything into infiltration. And then the third um, um, criticism was that they look at towards the commission's ability to uh, approve no greater than 5,000 square feet of wetland fill. And it's not wetland fill. I'm sorry. That, that was clarified for me. It's, the, the commission can approve up to 5,000 square feet of wetland fill, but in terms of calculation of impact, MassDP looks at alteration, mm -hmm. and they look at temporary and permanent alteration. So we were carrying 2,700 square feet of permanent um, alteration that we thought was... Um, but she had actually pointed out that in areas where we propose um, temporary disturbances of alteration brings us, uh, we're still under 5,000, we're at uh, 4,700 for areas that are to be restored. But what they did was they looked at, um, when I, I, I tried to throw a surface area calc at where we're doing the tree and um, um, I just said this is, uh, 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 500 uh, linear feet, and this is five feet wide, so this is, uh, you know, 2,000 square feet of restoration that we're offering. And they had said, well, that's alteration, so that calculates towards your thing. So we've clarified in our letter that we don't, for what the, the sake of what we're doing, which is exclusively above ground work without any grading, minimal ground disturbance. And the, the ground disturbance would essentially be cutting and removing invasive species and, and boring holes this big to put potted plants in and, and backfill them. That that's we're not we're not carrying those calculations towards our, our impact area calculations. So um, we feel in response to Mass DP that we've returned this project into a uh, permittable compliant project. And I'd be happy to field any questions in, in that regard. So we're not going to get a response from DEP until we either approve this project or deny it. Um, and and my conversations with DEP is that they're they're very uh, skeptical of filling wetlands, and there's a lot to look at here. And this may be an opportunity to. Um, you know, take a, deep, a deeper look into 
whether we're going to start approving uh, filling wetlands in a quote unquote degraded wetland area, but which DEP doesn't see it that way. Wetland is a wetland. There's no classifications for wetlands. Um, so I, I thought this would be an opportunity to, to bring in some outside help <coughs> to work through this, this problem. Um, so my recommendation on whether they've met the standards and if it's uh, possible to fill this is to get a third party review to look at uh, their proposal and give us some guidance on that. So. so, so, but in terms of a scope, it sounds like that would be a relatively small level of effort. It's yep. literally a, a review of the plan, comparison with the as assumptions and the standards and give us a, a unique outsider's opinion. Right. Well, we can put a scope together. I think what else, uh, other things that this impacts is the, right. the amount of fill that's happening or alteration um, gets into some of the mitigation that we wanted with um, the walking trail and the bank restoration and the disturbance in the, in the stream. Uh, those should be looked at also. I, I think that's a good, well, my personal thing is that's a good idea. I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, I think I gave my opinion earlier. I think that from what I've heard, DEP doesn't carry that same opinion of, like you said, a wetland is a wetland is a wetland, and they see filling that as a, a, a truly negative impact. Um, I think we want to make sure we're careful here as to what's actually being performed because really the, the way this works is DEP gives their comments, but there's no second round. This is on us. It's, it's on us to... To make our decision. Make our decision yeah. after that. Um, and yeah. I think from my standpoint, because I already see this as like, I don't quite understand their perspective that I would value a, a professional opinion. I think one of the other things is, is the DEP didn't put eyes on this. Just looking at this, this yeah. was designated as a wetland. This looks more like a junkyard to me rather than a wetland. I think, yeah. I mean, this I think is, we've had There's no doubt that this is going to be an improvement over what's there now. The EP is just looking at a plan on a piece of paper. They're not looking at the existing conditions that are on the site right now. Not, I don't know whether that would make any difference in the person that actually wrote this letter and rendered their opinion, but it certainly makes a difference to me as sure. a member of this commission. Sure, you can tell, tell me different, tell differently, but I mean, my impression from the conversations with DEP is that they, understanding of whatever the condition may be, you know, the, and, and the fact that, yeah, way, the way they're doing it is check the boxes. It's a wetland and right. therefore you shouldn't. Well, that's, that's their take. And, and it's degrading yeah. is, is a, you know, a, a value mm -hmm. that we're providing to it, right? That's, that's an assessment that we're, each individual is making. Um, For the Wetland Protection Act, it's presumption of area subject to protection. It's that, you know, and, and if, if it is a wetland, um, then it's already presumed, regardless of the quality of it, it's already presumed to be an area subject to protection. Isn't that, yep. that's what I got no, from that's, the that, that's, that's accurate. I would like to add, though, that um, you, you're, you're exactly right, that from DEP's context, from a regulatory context, that boarding vegetated wetland is, it doesn't matter the quality of it, the regulations remain the same. But the presumption of significance that, that is the burden of our the applicant of us to overcome right. is demonstration of protection of the interests of the Wetlands Protection Act. And that's where you get beyond just BVW and you actually get into a functions and values analysis of the quality of that wetland in the in the interests that are served by that wetland. Does this serve uh, you know to what degree? Does this degraded system serve wildlife habitat? To what degree does it serve uh, fisheries habitat, shellfish, stormwater protection? And we've systematically provided a response letter addressing individual protections in the interest of um, what what we believe to be a, a net benefit in the post construction. If I could just quickly add, really, Dust, uh, under the regulations, I mean, the beauty of it is that you know DEP is doing a two dimensional review. Is we did invite um, the analyst out. We recognize they don't have time. They don't want to be a, an initial review before a review by the commission and then a superseding review after that. <clears throat> so they are looking at it as a wetland. 
And what they do is in the regs, they put that responsibility on this commission. And they make very clear discretionary authority. And that's <coughs> where you make your money for serving on this commission is that responsibility to have to look at the nuance of the site, what value is there to this, and in making those calls. Ultimately, if it ever gets before DEP again, they would have to review that. And that's why, you know, to close it out, we would agree. I think a consultant is really to the commission's best interest and we fully support that idea. Just to get the record straight, make sure everything's out there. I think I think having well, if it turns out to be two sides supporting having true defense, you know, two professionals saying the same thing, coming to some sort of agreement, I think is only going to be a benefit to all sides um, to make sure that that whatever goes back to DEP is something that's even more defensible. So, so we so to that degree, we are we are certainly a minimum. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm happy that we are having the dialogue about what the scope of that review would be um, in the context of. Um, Making you guys comfortable yeah. with uh, uh, reassurances that this is a vanilla project, <laughs> but I guess our apprehension would be opening Pandora's box to um, full-scale, you know, top to bottom review of stormwater report. And uh, well, our wetland delineation was subject to an ORED, so that's bound. But it would, I mean, it, it could, and that really is at your discretion of, of to what degree the scope. Um, of the review. But we're comfortable. Has the stormwater? Has the stormwater been reviewed, Chuck, by engineering? That will be not sure. I don't know. We sent we sent revised um, stormwater um, January twenty. Certainly not finished. finished so I guess. Maybe we need a follow up with engineering about that. No, be here. I think this is unlike our other project. Uh, There's not many Alice places street. for the water to go. Yeah, it's not going to flow toward the street, so. So yeah, so the Howard Street it was recommended that we got engineering review with that too from our That's engineers, and I can have the same discussion and find out if they want something like just, that. But I just wanted that limited scope just to find out about the filling and some other things on the project, and then just you know, just a good sanity check. Though, get some good comments and some good conditions from the third party reviewer. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I would. So what do we need? What do we need to do to take steps to to get that moving? As far as we usually have to get three bids, right? Get some call, get some. Yeah. So I, I talked to a procurement today, and they said that we could choose someone with a scope of work, and if we stayed under ten thousand um, dollars, we could we could hire that person. I mean, I could check again, so we wouldn't have to go through this process. Um, but that ten thousand dollars is. So this one company would be the total that we could run up a bill for for the next three years. That's that's one of the ways to fast track this. But we also could send out. Uh, cool. Explain the first one to me again. I don't quite understand what you just said. Yeah, I'm, we've got a we've got like an MSA with a engineer, or we're you're just saying what? what? <laughs> Yeah, and under ten thousand dollars is the threshold now. I, I thought it that, used that to be five, to, but now it's that we now don't have to go 10. out for. We can just we can solicit our own person. Yep. That's not someone, but that has to be ten thousand dollars or three or yeah, less or less. Over three oh, years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, that so gives us the that. opportunity. I can. I mean, I look think our scope other... is going to be well under that. So um, I, would, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah, it should be. Yeah. That provides any comfort. It won't be changed when now that we've finalized it, uh, yeah. you guys take a vote. But uh, right now, it looks like we can just pick pick a certain company and ask them for uh, to look at the scope and then give a price and then report that back to the applicant. Okay. Do you guys have any questions or concerns in this regard? Yeah. 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 Chuck, do you have any names in mind that you've been that you've been thinking or recommendations? Does anybody have any? Yeah, I'd like, um, uh, you know, Horsey Witten is really good, but I think uh, Ann Martin at LEC would really help us out here. Uh, so I'm hoping that she's available. Okay. Does anybody have any issues with that? I think that's a particular recommendation there, Chuck. You can, you can offer some other people. Yeah, I mean, um, I thought that. We did a great job with this previous one, but I thought they were a combined. We got 
wetland and storm water out of them. That was part of like why we carved them down. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it's well, is um, she's very well reputed. Yeah. Um, so I'm. I'm proud of I could I could send one to both of them. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. Okay. So what's a reasonable period of time to actually get someone on board and then get an opinion? Let's see. I'm not sure. I, I'm probably it's delayed this for. Well, it's an idea there's, there's, yeah, there's many it's things happening. So meeting. if if so, uh, LEC has is a vendor, and so is Horsley Witten. So we don't have to go through that process. But that has added a month to the process in the past. Okay. Because uh, they have to review the contracts and they have to agree to the contracts and it's back and forth with all that. Um, so those are two good choices. Uh, so I would think that the user commission have to vote on, or can you approve it? Bring no, it I'll bring you. it all back to the commission. So we're, <coughs> hopefully I can get uh, this all packaged up and delivered to the commission within a week or at least at the next meeting. It, um, maybe worth before going out to them, if, if you've developed what you've got for what you're thinking for a scope is, I'd like just the applicant to make sure he has a chance to comment before. I'll share the scope. Yeah, with the applicant. We'll probably work on it together. Uh, I think it's the best know, way sure to that we all agree on that. the show, yes. scope. So there's no surprises when something comes back. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you guys getting Arjuna over time frame? I understand. No, I mean, we would we would request a continuance. I mean, preferably maybe the end of February just to check in. We don't expect to have that back. Say it's. Yeah, it's as easy as just continuing. Yeah, yeah so, so that would be our request. Yeah. Okay. That's part of it. We won't know until I, I, I serve in a commission myself when we do peer reviews. So a lot of times you'll 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 give the you'll give a scope in application materials to the consultant and they'll look it over and say, This is gonna take me a week, this will take me three weeks. This will like I, I they'll, they'll give you a schedule of, of when they think it's yeah. So I move we continue the hearing to the end of February. Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Sorry. Well, this is. I just. No, I appreciate that. I can see you. Thank you. Yeah, get some, good, get some good opinions. Absolutely. Get a variety of opinions, balance the cost, and you'll figure it out. Thank you. All right. So you don't have to report it. Yeah, they should. They should have. They should have. I definitely have a lot of questions. That's up to me. That's what I'm doing right now. Because I'm putting together specs for slow and projects. Well, so no matter what, though, they're going to be paid. Alright, move on to our Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone. Thank you. Move on to our next public hearing. Notice of intent. Continuation of the notice of intent for Zero Havel Street, 270 0728. Uh, it's uh, being formed according to the Wetland Protection Act and the Wetland Bylaws. Uh, it's proposed for two single family dwellings, deck, driveways, retaining wall, rooftop. Additional items within 100 feet of the buffer zone and uh, for the wetland. I'll start by introducing the commission. Starting on my right. David Connect. John Sullivan. Martha Moore. Anika Scanlon, Vice Chair. Michael Flynn, Chair. Carl Sipoli. Mayor Vincennes. Nicola Mazur. Scott Keith. Good evening, Constitution Administrator. Good evening. My name is Maureen Harold from Melissa Environmental Services. Um, we filed this notice of intent back in November, and it was for the construction of uh, two single family dwellings. Uh, the commission 
think we did a site walk before the holidays. I want to say at some point in December on your plan um, that's highlighted in green. That's the bordering vegetated wetland. We walked that line. It's fairly well defined, falls into small topographic variety of slope. In addition to that, we have an isolated wetland that's shown on the plan as the B series. That's um, over 1,500 square feet. It is jurisdictional under the local regulations. Um, the original plan that was submitted to the commission, this was not on it. Uh, we did look at it in the field, and it's corrected now, and we show it on the plan. So the 100-foot buffer zone, as you can see, is highlighted in yellow on the plan. We also highlight the 25-foot no disturb in yellow, the 35-foot no structure in orange. So as you can see, the proposal for the two single-family houses do encroach within the 25-foot uh, zone of natural vegetation as well as the 35-foot uh, no structure. Um, this includes the dwellings, the patios, the decks, the driveway. Uh, in terms of mitigation and what we'd like to do is we are proposing rooftop infiltration uh, for both structures. We are proposing infiltration for the driveway. So essentially the entire site will be infiltrated. Um, in addition to that, we are proposing um, a 12.8 acre uh, piece to either be donated to the down, deeded to the down, or be put into a conservation <coughs> And that's this parcel A here. This parcel A, on the larger scope of things, but the larger parcel, you can see it here in green, um, that the town already owns. I think it's called, is it called Timberneck? Timberneck Swamp. Timberneck Swamp. Um, to accommodate for the restriction, we are proposing a three foot wide. Uh, gravel access trail so that people can access this portion of the area. Um, obviously, I know it's a long night. <laughs> I wish I had a deck project that matches setbacks, but I don't. <laughs> so, essentially, what I'd like to walk out of here is just to get an idea from the commission if you're open to actually granting the variances. Um, these lots were created in 1960. Obviously, it predates the bylaws. Um, they weren't in effect at that time. The dimensional setbacks weren't in effect at that time. Um, is there any consideration? <laughs> Everybody looking at me. <laughs> well, my. <laughs> My, I, I do not see a way I could um, grant variance for this, for construction um, inside the 25 foot for these two lots. I would agree. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling more in it. I think... This is a, a, a lot of work inside the 25. Um, I realize that you know, the 12.8 acres is, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, mm -hmm. But this is a lot of work. I think in particular, you know, having, you know, there was a point at which the area to remain undisturbed, I think that I thought, I was thinking, well, that was going to be you know, turned into more wetland or, but... It already is mostly, I mean, it's this odd shaped, it already is wetland. Right. Um, I'm, I per, I'm personally struggling to, to find a way to say this is a variance that I'd be willing to grant. I don't know what others. <clears throat> I just think it kind of opens Pandora's box. How would 25? I would agree. Um, okay, so I, I get I, the gist of the commission. Um, I did provide an alternative analysis as part of the application. Just so the commission knows, we did push the dwellings up as close to the roadway as possible. We required a 20 foot setback. Look, we could go to the ZBA, but it's unlikely they would give us a variance because it has to be based on soil, topography, that type of hardship. Uh, 
unfortunately, they don't consider a setback from a wetland a hardship. Um, so I don't think going that route would be beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, if the commission this is... Has, this has to be two lots, the, the separation where it is. I have a question about that, too. Um, I think, I mean, obviously the client wants to have two lots there, and it's pretty tight, uh, obviously. I mean, we can certainly look to see... Right center there? We can certainly look to see if we can possibly reduce the dwelling sizes, shift it a little bit to see if we can meet the 25 foot for the no structure. It would have to be a tiny house. <laughs> <laughs> it would have to be. It would have to be two tiny houses. <laughs> can one you do one multifamily? Yes. Yeah. Can I ask you what about making this as two units as a two unit condo? Yeah. And you squish the two of them together. That might be an option. Yeah. And then if you so if you took these two dwellings and you actually slid them together. Right where that one ninety six is. Right. You know, if you actually okay. run it into inside the, I just looking at the the twenty five foot line. That's that's why I said it. That just opens Pandora's box. I understand. You know, I mean, I understand. I I know. Like I said, I wish it was a deck project, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. So, um, does the driveway have to go around the side? Could the driveway just go in like? under in the front and you're not the, disturbing all that area on the side? It's a great up. suggestion, but Haverhill Street is the pits. Yeah. So this yeah. is near the Wakefield side and yeah. people fly on that. I would be scared to pull out of a garage. Plus, right. plus groundwater shallow. Okay. So if you, you're you going to have to dewater your garage constantly <laughs> if you put it underground. Okay. I think we can certainly look into that option. In terms of zoning, I don't know if we could do a duplex. We might have to go back, but I think it's a great suggestion. And just for clarity, um, so out, is it outside of the 2B, between the, two, between the B series and the A series is wetland? Yeah, so but actually, inside the B series is not wetland? No, so it's the opposite. So the B series, it, it looks like it was man-made. Originally, I had thought it might have been like dug out for a drainage purpose for Haverhill Street. Somebody said maybe a foundation, but it's just kind of a, a bowl. It's a low area. A low area, and it meets uh, the local regs for isolated. <coughs> okay, so that... So we're, inside. say that again. So inside, this inside is wetland. Is wetland. Yep. Right. And between B and A is not is wetland. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it looked like they were like digging up a, a house or something. In that area. Okay. And so away from the houses is also wetland beyond the A line? Yeah. Correct. So oh, everything green. This way is wetland. Okay. So, so I, I think there's some work to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna need a continuance. Yeah. Okay. Um, the the one thing I would add, you know, I know this is this came up in the last meeting. You when we did the site visit, we went and checked out the the area that you've somewhat designated as a. Uh, the three foot wide and I mean th th that's on like a big old big slope you know there's there's not really you know I, I think what's gotten confused and I'd be open to the other things here is if this were to keep on coming back you know I, I think we my position is we need to have the ability to, to have a, a access to that just from a connectivity standpoint but I don't think we're talking about a path I don't think a, a path can actually be built there Based on what the condition was out there, continuing back. Kind of, it was a low spot. Yeah, I mean, it just like drops off, and it was yeah. just like a big. I mean, if you look at the contours, I mean, this mm -hmm. thing is not. Would we need the trails committee? The whole trails committee coming <laughs> yes. in with, with this is beyond the trails trails committee. Uh, the whole boardwalk. Boardwalk. Kind of 
What about if we accessed it off of, does that say B Street, Best Street? Oh, yeah, B Street, it does. B. Up top. So that's A oh, Street, right. B Street. Okay, so that might be an option. Perhaps it looks like there's maybe a sliver. Of, I don't know who owns that land, but mm -hmm. I could check to see if that's an option. Yeah. On there, what's your property? So we're it's over here. Ah, blue. Blue. Little here chunk here. Street. Yeah, okay. but essentially this whole... The blue line is yeah. what you're talking about. And yeah. this is Timberneck Swamp, the yes. green part? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, within the best interest of the community to, to get areas like that, I, I think that what we're talking about is not necessarily the best fit yet. So I move we continue. Move on. You can take more move questions. On. Sure. We can continue. Uh, one of the things I want to solve tonight is uh, a applicant hasn't paid his bylaw fees. I want to vote from the commission whether they're going to uh, entertain the variance for the bylaw fees or we can continue, but they're going to have to write a check if uh, we won't accept this. So that's one more thing we have to do tonight. So here's the... Here's the Worksheet if you want to go through this morning. <clears throat> so, um, this bylaw fees is for the pro proposal that's in front of you. So, it's the two single family houses, and then the commission charges like a dollar twenty five per square foot within the twenty five foot, and then I think the same for the thirty five foot. But obviously, this is you know revolving, right? I'm going to come back with something different. And as a result, how does that work? Uh, I don't. I thought when you come in, you pay the fees. Isn't that, is that how it's done in every town? Isn't it? Well, it is. But if we're paying for fees for work we're not doing, I mean, I, I don't know if the commission is open to the, considering the work that the commission is doing <laughs> by taking <clears throat> taking those uh, possibilities off the table is what that bylaw is paying for, and and it's our work. And so I, I think we've gone far enough. I mean, if you want to take some money off this, it's fine. Or if you want to waive it all together, it's fine. But we really can't come to the next meeting without this being resolved. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, I, I think I don't necessarily see a, a good reason for a waive at, at this point. Um, you know, I'm worrying if, if there was something that you had a understanding, yeah. No, I, I mean we've done a sidewalk based on on everything that's been in front of us. I, unless there was something really, some extreme thing the town was getting, I, I don't see a reason to have a waiver for a project like this. I don't know if any other Dave or or Nika or anybody has any other opinions, but um, one one thing I will add is I think something that, that I've kind of come to recognition is that recently is like I don't think there's any other commission in town that actually waives fees um, we, we have done it in the past for say uh, in the past for Camp Curtis Guild, Cape Cur Guild, Curtis Guild back in the 30s filled in a wetland and put a little cabana on it and they came back to us and they removed those buildings you know, and they restored the wetland so for that we said we'll waive the fees and um, What's the school? Austin Prep. Austin Prep. Prep. So Austin Prep, mm -hmm. not only did we have a nonprofit, first of all, plus they do the public benefit of allowing everyone to use their tennis courts, and now they're doing another site, and they say that's open when they're not using it to the people of Reading. So, so I don't think this fits into those categories, so I don't really see the reason. Yeah. Either. So those are the ones we've waived, and I think we've waived others. Sure. And I don't know. So obviously my <clears throat> client requested this. I did this on behalf of my client. Mm -hmm. um, what if we pay the 1200 for the two single family dwellings? And then can we look at maybe if I'm going to be redesigning outside the 25 foot, maybe, I mean, if I'm not doing work within that area and I get an approval, would the commission consider waiving that category? We're not coming back with 
We have to be done. We have to. Yeah. So let's not. So this is supposed to be. I'm okay with you asking for some submission. money off. That's great. But let's just get to that number tonight. So you have to guess what you're going to come back with. <laughs> and if you, it's just been too long, and, and I have to, like, carry this. And it's it's two houses. It's seven grand. It seems to be, you know, reasonable for two houses. And now you're going to draw them in a little bit. Um, so yeah. maybe there's not as much disturbance. But you, you were able to ask that question. I mean, I, I don't know what, what it'll come back with, but... I mean, that's what I would like. I would like a decision tonight. So Mark writes a check, and then we can get this on the agenda for the next, um, and all of it. So, you know, one of the things that's on here, which should be on here, is um, the evaluation of the wetland line. It's on there, 125 per linear foot of resource area boundary. Yeah. So, so you that's get one we, should, we don't have to worry about. That is that is what it is, no matter what you propose. Right. Okay. Well, tell me the amount and you'll get the check. I would just look at this. I know this is a, a, a filing fee, correct? Yeah. But actually, it states $1.25 per square foot of buffer zone altered for any temporary or permanent alteration. And also, just remember, I so, said I don't want to waive the fees, yeah. but but reducing them, yeah. that's that's. I'm okay with the the the, the house fees and the 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 resource area boundary delineation. I'm not I'm not so sure. I'm okay with the the uh, charges for the uh, temporary or permanent alteration because that's you basically already told that that's that's a that's a no. Right. So, I would say no. I wouldn't before that. The others, yes. Um, and then she can come back and and try and slice this a different way. It's, so it's pay those two fees. It's a so hold on because I think you, you need to apply something. It's a dangerous game if we start letting applicants come in and hold payments with application with projects in hand. I mean, I, I get it. That's that's a a big number, but I mean. The, they they understood that when they proposed what they're proposing. If mm -hmm. if understanding what we are potentially getting back, we want to take some sort of deduction on that twenty five, the the twenty five foot. I'd be open to something very small. No, not knowing what necessarily was coming back, but we need to have something. And and ultimately, this this is due at the time you submit, not mm -hmm. not this like open it up, let the project evolve, and then let's decide what we can. Pay at the permit. Here with the permit. Uh, so I, I so so I guess I would propose <coughs> understanding that we're going to get something less on the square footage there. That that that's what above. What I would say is twelve hundred. The the six oh three are are you know those are unchanged. And if we did five thousand, you know, I, on the knowing that it's a smaller area, I'm fine with that. So five thousand plus the eighteen oh three. Yes. There you go. Motion to continue. So moved. Well, I can't make let's, that motion. Let's actually I'm just have someone to in the along. commission. To <laughs> make I made the motion before Chuck brought <laughs> okay. this up. Actually. Do I hear? It just needs to be seconded. Well, uh, any comments from the public? Yeah, um, I have one. I'm a little concerned. I still don't understand the whole deal with the trail. Yeah. And I just missed what this what this lady had said, where they're gonna act as a farm. And it looks like you have can you go back over. No, that, that that's just proposed though. That's yeah. that's not accepted at this point. It's another access proposal. Okay. So, so it's, it's well, it hasn't been changed yet. But I guess my question is, I just want to know, living at Barney Circle. What is the trail for? Is it just an access? Or are we going to have a trail for? It's just an access. access, right? So if if there's a <coughs> deed or a access granted to the area in the back, the, the town needs to have some sort of ability to actually get there. Your know, right, an easement to actually cross the private property. 
and get to that area. Well, uh, is that walkway going to be continued at a later date all the way through that? It, there isn't currently something, anything proposed to do that. And, and right now, I don't know if you've seen that area. That's The area is, is not great for, you know, if you've seen the, the yeah, slope. See, it, and, and maybe I missed something, you know, because I, I don't, I'm not really up on the whole project. But I thought that trail chuck was on the property of the houses. It looks like it's different. No, it's it's still on the it's it's still on. They their can't property. give us anything that's not on their property. Yeah. Okay, I was just curious because it looked like it was. Did I miss that? And no, you're so right. So it's this, this here. It looked like this was on your property, and now the trail's over here, and it's part of this. That's the idea. So it's going to be part of the, the conservation of what we're using. But I want to look to see if the land goes up to the street. So we're going to look to see if we can actually here. I think what what the important piece of this is is they've got to come back with or something. So it's there's nothing set as to where there's access, where there's going to be. Yeah, I, under, access. I understand they need access, but I guess I don't understand. Is it that, so you won't know if there's further plans to do something with that chunk until the whole project is approved. Yeah, uh, I mean. I, you, you must know Timonex Swamp pretty well. I mean, there's really nothing out there. I mean, so I don't think there's any plans to. I mean, there's no, there is no plans. Well, Timonex and is on it, the other side, right? where would it be on some imaginary list that exists? It's not even, it wouldn't be on that. It's too wet. It's, it's kind of an isolated spot. The best thing about it, it's connectivity to a bigger spot we have. And, and that's what it is. We need the access so, like Mike said, we can get to the land. Uh, if it's a conservation restriction, you're supposed to walk the boundaries once a year. So you'd be able to get to that land, but you can't get to that I don't land. think you can get to any land. It's pretty wet right beyond that, <laughs> yeah. right beyond that <laughs> point. Yeah. We, can't, we couldn't make it very far up. Yeah. So, I mean, you can understand that concern. It's just that we had talked about it before, Chuck, and we had gone to the other, the other board about the parking. If it does get accessible to people, that it's going to cause us a big problem. It's really going to change the dynamics of our neighborhood. It's not it's likely. If it, if it was dry, we would be having a different conversation, but it's not. You know it's pretty wet down that end of, I don't know what this is called, but it's going to be called part of Temenek Swamp in the future. So it's pretty wet there most of the year. Yeah. Um, but can, I don't know. Don't they put walkways? Don't you have walking trails on wet land? We, yeah, we try to do those in areas that are uh, well used. And because it costs a lot of money, we usually have grants for that. And... Um, so it has to have more activity than what's here. Yeah. And so. you can understand that concern, you know? No, I, I can't just you know, leave here tonight knowing that. There's no plans right now, but, but you're right. If the way this works out, some conservation commission or trails committee in the future could say, you know, I, I don't, it, it's so wet, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be really, really hard. But they could say, let's do something. If they somebody could do donates, a road trail If somebody's willing to donate yeah. a lot and, of and money labor. in board labor. Walls. So, and, labor. and labor. And it's just too hard. I mean, it's not really it's unreal. something that they're doing. We have to get through all that. No, no, I, yeah, uh, it's understood. We and, look for dry areas, and then we'll span across a river or a stream. And then walk this, for a while, and then and the same thing. But to walk, to just do boardwalks, all wetlands. So wasn't there a wetlands. conversation about Chuck that there's a, a dry spot in the middle of that? There is, but 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 there's so much. There's like three or four hundred feet between this and and that other area. So um, where was the where was the recent boardwalk project? There's a boardwalk in Millet between Hunt Street and uh, Willow. And uh, conservation owns that land, and the select board owns the other part of the land. And there's so there's a couple. It's like I don't know, two thousand feet, and we're only we're only doing one hundred and fifty feet of boardwalk. One hundred fifty feet of boardwalk. That was like two years in the making, and grants, and funding, and a lot of a lot of labor from oh, donated wow. people. Yeah, it takes a while. So you don't really foresee that happening. I, this, in this, in this in area. a project like that would have to... We're not to, trying to be a pain. We're just trying to find out what's actually happening. Yeah, yeah. so that's not on the table. But to, to not lose this opportunity to get and, and protect this land in the future, to always say that this now belongs to the Conservation Commission or there's a CR on it so we can control its future, which is no building, no matter what happens to the regulations. You know, that's, that's our thought right now. Um, I think everybody, they showed that easement you had before, and everybody was concerned about people coming in and walking that and, and being able to access their properties and 
worry about break-ins and all that stuff. No, and I think it was I think it was said in that first meeting like oh it, like a pass. I think that that that's how it was presented and, and the, the idea of this is just as we said we need access okay. to get out there. Yes. And I hear your concerns, and that that's why I want to look at that alternative, which is B yeah. Street, see what it looks like. If it's higher and drier, it makes more sense yeah. to just have the access yeah. off that road. And I know it's another committee and everything, but we've got big problems on Barney Circle, and it's... No, I... I don't want to add to it. I, no, I get it. I get it. So... So the, you, they're going to come back with no two single families. You're going to make it a duplex now. Well, we'll we hear. Don't, we don't. We don't have something. anything in front of us, and we, we try not to design it for them. Yeah, yeah. it looks like. I'll stop. It's late. <laughs> <laughs> we got one more comment. Go ahead. It was seventy six thousand eight hundred bucks you were going to charge this guy for fees, and you gave him a discount. How come when we built the house on? We put an addition on. We had to come up with cash with no discounts, no nothing. No. You should have hired me. You got to know the right people. Yeah. Yeah. I had to say something. Uh, <laughs> well played. Go ahead. We'll, we'll go My more. name's Rick, and I live at 114 Haven, which abuts the property. The only concern, aside from the trail, path, whatever you want to call it, because, yes, if you've been out there, you've seen... It goes and it's deep, yeah. And it's probably be a complete waste of money. But I'm only concerned with the house itself being that much closer to the street because a lot of our houses are already 50 to 60 feet past the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And the wetlands themselves, the I've owned the house since '93, and since '93, I've seen those little pink ribbons go on trees, but I've never seen anything. Again, I don't know if it's the commission. They just gave up. I'm not sure. But just the amount of land to put even two houses, let alone one, and what they're going to do to inter interfere with. I don't know about my rest of my neighbors, but every now and then I have to deal with the mouse problem. Unfortunately, this is Reading. We do live out, and <laughs> it's expected. But what? how would that impact everything else that's in that area? That's just my concerns. Right. Yeah. I, what's that? Low impact. Yeah, I, that's relative to all the other. I mean, when we're talking about large developments, yeah. that, that's when those issues generally come up. Um, not generally for house a house project. Um, uh, I'm only saying that because of where it is. With again, it's all water. It's yeah, all, it's all water, and in the summer it might get dry, but. The way the rain is around here, it doesn't want to stop. I haven't seen that creek dry since we've been there. There's always in the winter, yeah. In the summer, there's still that much. It doesn't water. take very long back there I mean, before everything gets wet. This stove's there from God knows when. We moved in in '93. There was two stoves all rusted, and they're even worse rusted now. They've been there. Nobody come around to pick any junk up. It's all past tense. It's kind of comical because I understand how they're trying to be so strict in everything they do. But when we bought our houses, I had. I had a 120-foot driveway of tar under two inches of dirt that they covered over that I found in that album get taken out. Stoves, water heaters. I mean, it was unbelievable. And it was like, and, and we're worried about, you know what I mean? Like what we do. Yeah. How did that even get approved like that? I know it's a separate issue, but... And I know you weren't here then, Chuck, but I, I don't know who does that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it sounds it, it, like... It's a, ridiculous. So we're going in the right direction. Yeah, I, I think it's, I it's the important thing. Yeah. No. So we're just worried what it's going to do to our neighborhood. That's all. Understood. You know? Thank you, guys. Okay. So we have a motion on the table to continue. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Ken Gregory Lane. We have a minor plan change for order of conditions. Uh, Ken Gregory Lane, this was. Chuck, remind me what this project was. So, yeah. So, um, here's the letter. And. 
the applicant wants to remove a two foot by two foot wide crushed stone trench that's on the drawing um, and instead of putting in that trench which is for infiltration they're going to modify their uh, impervious paver patio to a pervious paver patio um, and this is this is the area where, 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 where we're talking about here. Um, so it's, here's the trench. It's at the end of this paver patio. There's a, kind of like a recessed area right here with a drain that just kind of out in this area. Um, but there's the trench. He, he doesn't like the way that looks. They had started a little bit and threw some stone in it. And he said it didn't. It just threw off uh, the feeling that he was getting from his project. So he's willing to um, modify his project. And this was uh, impervious before, but he wants to make it pervious. And he has um, proposed to use. Uh, that's just a picture. So those spacers in between the bricks. Mm -hmm. And um, the infill he hasn't found yet, but he uh, he so wants a, to use something like that. So he it's on a pervious paving system. He's just increasing creating a joint permeability. Yeah, permeability. yeah. So it's because he he can't find the pavers in the color he wants. Oh jeez. So what he's doing is risking those per pervious paver systems have their own detail. And they're you know guaranteed to work for twelve months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just kidding, but you know so if that's a good idea. I just don't know if that. You know, so that's not new. real. That spacer that does that doesn't block. I mean, like ideal block doesn't have those to make everything they, impervious. Right. They may, yeah, okay. but you're just typically buying it's like <coughs> buying a warranty. If you're making it up or altering it, and if it fails, it's your problem. That's all I'm saying. I, I don't know what the system is. If he's kind of creaky, that looks right. I'm just. Are you looking at a system? It's right there. Then they, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the theory it works well. Yeah. So, so. So basically, he's gonna do away with the stone trench and just bring the yard up to the edge of these pavers. Yeah. Right. That's gonna be grass it's now, right? The, two the, feet not... less of gravel yeah. between. And so let's just, just hold on before you kind of like go, whoa, what are we losing here? What, what are we losing here? So let's go back to the plan and um, just let... Oh, it's not on this one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're right, it is late. All right. You got um, me intrigued. Back, back to the plan. It's for Chuck to bring to them. Here's well, what are we row? losing here? Right here. So this is all on. I mean... What's to say it doesn't infiltrate between the edge of the paper patio now and before it hits, hits the well? I mean, what are we doing? I mean, that's it's grass. He's going to keep the grass there. Um, and yeah, Chuck, the, I, I think I think you're misunderstanding. I think we're fine with this. Oh, I thought she was saying, well, what are we losing? I, I was going to say, no, no, no. but I wanted to bring that up too. Just clarifying the scope. Like, okay, okay. so two feet you're, of gravel's gone. You're, you're fighting a winning argument. I was put off by uh, Carl. He was like, whoa, those aren't uh, official. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, so, uh, well, we got to okay, I think this is a, a, a relatively All right. uh, straightforward. Do I hear a motion? We got a, we got a 10... 56 yeah. approval. Uh, do I, I move if we approve the minor plan change. A second? second. All those in favor? All right. Thank you. <laughs> Is that too difficult? I thought, I thought that, Chuck, we you were going to... I was promised 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Old new business. Yeah. All right. Old new business. Uh, we've got a request for an extension of the order of conditions for Lyle State 364 Laurel Street for an additional two years. So this, um, just so everybody... So if you want to read the version. request letter, when you guys we, got it in your packet. When we issue an order of conditions, uh, it's valid for three years. And Buyers. And so this project is currently underway. They're building. They've 
They're actually on our list to, to come in for some issues that are have been brought in front of the commission, so they're just looking for an extension. They have two of four houses done, but they did the stream restoration and the invasive removal, and they put the roadway in. I thought they would ask for an additional three years based on how, how it's going. They're optimistic. So. <coughs> I move we extend the order of conditions for two years. Second. All those in favor? All right. I have uh, this to sign, so if I could just pass this down and uh, sign that. What are you doing over there? Town land on Longfellow Road. Um, so, <coughs> yes, yeah, we received a, uh, a notification from a resident and former commission member about some uh, activities occurring on, on Longfellow Road. Um, Chuck or Amy, do you want to just kind of let us know what you guys saw? Well, so, okay. Amy Shukatani, I was a former member of the Conservation Committee, 34-year resident of Reading. Uh, I live on Longfellow right now, and I met these wonderful people, and they began to tell me of, uh, there's an area, a town owned area on Longfellow, which people are dumping items. And there is a stream of water in the bottom of this particular area. So to me, it's actually very horrifying. And then you see trash, you see litter. I mean, they can go into more explicit detail. But um, I have myself witnessed neighbors bringing in a uh, tarp, bags and bags of leaves, filling the top out, attaching it to their truck going down to this area and dumping it, and it's more than one truckload. So, so to me, that's just, it's horrifying, and it's unacceptable. And, and I think something should be done. I can, I can add to that. Um, Joseph Horwata, I'm a 34 watch for a role. I have but part of the uh, parcel. And just to give you some context, for years, the land was privately owned. And people would take their leaves, and they just kind of dump it off to the side and push it back. And one thing led to another, and then occasionally um, a landscape contractor would pull up and they would empty the building. Uh, you know, leaves, um, sorry, lawn clippings into there. And, you know, if nobody said anything, and then it got to be worse. I've been there for 35 years, and my wife and I, uh, at some point started to say to some of the new people who had heard from the people that had moved out that, oh, you don't need to take your uh, leaves or clippings to the town landfill. You can just go down the end of the street and just dump it down there. Mm -hmm. Well, anyhow, uh, so that kind of took, took off and um, what was once leaves and just sort of a, you know, little sort of wink of the eye, throw it down the, uh, the edge of the, uh, the area, now has turned into um, there are whole limbs of trees. I saw somebody dragging a tree one time. I didn't see him dragging it, but I, I heard it and later saw it, and they pushed it. It was probably about 30 feet. And they just dumped it where the leaves, where there's a little path where the leaves get dumped over. And so now, effectively, it's like a roadblock. So now all the leaves are closer to the road. And I personally am affected because the wind, when you get a windy day, it just, just you know, blowing those leaves. But we've been in a position where we've said to people, hey, you know, this is a now town owned land and, you know, you really shouldn't do it. And then people will say, well, you know, uh, my friend does it or this and that does it. And we just thought, I, I've seen in Andover, they have signs that will say Conservation Commission land uh, per order, whatever, you know, $100, um, you know, fine for dumping, something like that. I think might be enough to deter a lot of the people. And, and I will add, you know, in terms of, you know, your mandate, that the leaves have accumulated to the point now where they are starting to, I, from what I could see, encroach onto the wetlands area. Definitely, they definitely are. They definitely are. So a very simple request. Uh, I think that would be appreciated by a lot of people, would be if you just put a sign up there, you know, and a couple of uh, trees and, saying, you know, this is a Conservation Commission land, um, and it might, uh, it might help things a bit. Two signs, at least. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I, I checked into this land. It actually belongs to the town, and it's but it's under our jurisdiction because there is a stream and a BBW in there. Um, so the DPW department said if I buy signs, they'll buy the poles and install them. So we can we can work on a couple of signs, and I can pay for that um, as long as you give me a vote to do that. And um, Ian Moss, number 50, Longfellow, was in here because as we looked at this land, uh, another thing came up, which was um, you can see that there's this shed right here. Um, and it's, it's definitely on the town land. And um, he's proposing, that he's, first he says it's like 30 years old. It's not something that he put there. It's been there for the life. That, that he knows at this house and he's he's going to take it down and he'll move it up to the front of the house on his own property which is which is good for us and uh he's going to call me up for a site visit but i think from his description which is in a vegetated area around it it can't stay because obviously it's closer than it's probably closer than 15 feet or might even be 10 feet away from that stream yeah so uh, that's as far as it got. Um, so we can get the signs in. We can have the, the shed removed. Uh, as far as policing it, it's the neighbors that have to do that. Pictures are great. And something that can identify people is best. Uh, and then we can find them. So what signs say that violators will be fined or something to that effect? It's not our land, um, so I'm not sure. But so I could definitely put up the code, the town code, that... Uh, references, fines, and dumping is uh, a violation. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can, can I make a suggestion when they sure. order the signs that they order a couple more? Or remember like uh, Pineville, it's a couple of places over on Pineville. Other places. And the Hunt Street, you know, where. Yeah, the Hunt Street, just so we got one for Hunt Street and DPW paid for it for us, but. No. Is, there, is there a sign there? They, yeah, now. they did oh, it. They, is one. Yeah, they used to do this for us. And yeah, but you remember over at Pineville, you know, the two entrances? Yeah. There was a bunch of junk over there. We property. had talked about like, putting a sign like, over there. If he's maybe, property land. If, he, if DPW he's was he's like just like Indian, his own we buy a sign that maybe we buy a couple of extra for yeah. Over we could, well, I think we could use a, a couple of them in a couple of other, other areas places. Well, too. Just um, you know, not just buy one, buy some. Right. Because when you buy, you, sometimes you buy one, it's thirty-five dollars. You buy five, it's sixty dollars. Yeah, so exactly. now, these are pretty expensive, no matter what. So really? yeah, I think they're like thirty bucks each. Yeah. So uh, look into it, but uh, just give me a total of signs that you want. And I'll put something together and I'll send it out to everyone and you can comment on it. Is there any price break for multiple signs? That's what right. he's suggesting? Or do yeah, you think yeah. they're flat rate $30 each? Um, so we got the no hunting signs at uh, Terminex Swamp and I think we got 20 of them. I remember and somewhere in that mix what there was a price break. So I remember at the end of Hensey Street too. Check how, back. how do you? This happens at the end of street. Sorry. Go how ahead. do you place? Where do you place the signs? Do we? Can we? Do you go there and, or DBW installs them? Yeah. So can we? Because there are a couple of points where you can clearly see where people have created their their, their common place. That would maybe make well, sense for an obvious sign. I know a guy down the street that probably could put them exactly where we want. That's what. I'm, <laughs> yes. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. There's Sorry. points where it would probably be more efficient. Do you want to install them yourself? <laughs> for, for, yeah, you, we might be doing every one from now on if you install these two. Need a hammer. I, think we, I think we just got permission to put a camera on a house. <laughs> they could be installed hopefully before I can say the spring month. clean out. <laughs> yeah, the spring. Yeah, no Next fall. The spring. No. 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 I don't know. Uh, we don't buy signs all the time. The last time we did it, the DPW got that for us. I think that was probably a month. Probably the sooner the better, just because spring is coming and people will be cleaning out their leaves and whatever. If you guys happen to take any pictures. Yeah, this isn't, it's not going to stop them. But, yeah, so right, I think you know, pictures are best. Battery, you know, gonna Chuck, can we, uh, is there any potential for us to get some support from DPW to 
get some of this material out of there? Not that or I heard. Are we just gonna like live with? Not that I heard. So, so I this is I, I was gonna bring up. Um, you know, I, we've talked about this in the past, but when the Eagle Scouts come through, they always want to do like a boardwalk project. That's a great project for mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Well, I, so I we should keep this on our list. See the, the walk. The kids come down that road to go to, uh, to, go to the high, high school. school, and where our walk by ends, the, the the land picks up, and they walk sort of um, down where the uh, the grass is and where the lot is. And the big thing is, as you start getting into the spring, you start getting the brush that starts encroaching out to the street, and it's less safe for them. So if they ever wanted to just Actually, the town has done it a little bit from time to time, but it would help the kids in terms of having a walkway. I think we should just keep it in mind if we get in that. You know, they always come in with it. A boardwalk is a more attractive project to them, I think. But mm. this this is certainly something that's needed around the town. So just but, keep but it in mind. We the kids have cleaned up fine bit. They just brought the stuff to the end of the, like the trailheads and the DPW trailer. trailer. Picked I, it up. I don't think yeah. the scout troop that wanted to adopt it or did adopt Pineville has actually done any work out there. Mm -hmm. So this might be the year that they do that. Uh, so we haven't, you know, we're frustrated by these th the cleanups, but again, it's all volunteer help. So. Yeah, so the town came and there was a stove and a dishwasher out there and some yeah. buckets, and they did come right. and pick that up. Any chance of the town removing this big limb of tree? It's kind of buried under the leaves right yeah. now. Yeah. There's a Christmas tree there, too. So, oh, so, so this, the, this is town land. We're, I think we're doing what we can do in this area, and, and we've, you know, we've been very accommodating. But, you know, you can go to other departments. You can go to the DPW department. You can do C-Click-Fix. If you haven't done that on the DPW uh, website and and show them where this is and you know, you know you can talk to your select board members and and highlight this area. I mean, it's <clears throat> the the stream makes it our jurisdiction, but we don't own the land. Right. So, Chuck, um, other things we have done too in the past is a little bit of a letter campaign for that street. That would be great. Um, as a notice to all the yeah. residents who live on that street that we are specifically... We're paying attention. We're paying attention. And, and this, yeah. is some, can, this is actually how you can deal with your yard waste. And, and, yeah. That would be wonderful. Just a public notice to all the residents on that street. Yes, you want to take the notice of uh, the uh, postage all I hand over them for you. No, we won't put you in that position. <laughs> but. Yeah, I can do that too. Just a simple form letter. No, that's good. Uh, and that works. Let people know. Do I hear a motion for to give? Uh, do we have a quantity? Make a motion to approve. Um, so five, Manufacturer of signs, five? five. Do you think two? Five two, or more, whatever is yeah. a, a good, whatever you can get a good price Around for. five. Use your judgment from there. Five to ten. Yeah, what well, you can get a good bulk. I thought you guys were going to go for ten. <laughs> two here, ten eight, two would for, would you say? But there's two other spots, so there's only and then the other what, street two, ten, yeah. six well, we'll left. And you know what? I think we actually, like, so, uh, what's, what's the day that Hensi we have the tents? Um, Corner of Green and Eaton is a is a real problem. That, we, that we is a big the, problem. We will go uh, through 10 the, signs like that. Yeah. I think. Yeah. It's, it's just Why don't we say 10? It's a bad part of town. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, look at the guy that was around the corner. Oh. All right. The place that put the addition on, got about six feet of leaf litter, leaf litter in the backyard. So the best thing to do is to keep keep watching, keep talking to the neighbors, and all those in favor. I told the DPW that if <laughs> thank you, they could thank clean you. it up someday, it would be great. But they were really interested today. Yes, I do people project. I can't really do that. So they always come in. Thanks for coming. Yeah, for the so I, I, I use oh, my yeah, no, little sorry. landscape trailer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Right. But I can 
Mm -hmm. So I just want to let you know that the town forest uh, project is closed out. It's done. It looks really good. You should go out there. And we thought that it was going to look like a huge, clear-cut uh, forest. <laughs> they, they just did selective cutting. Um, Check it the, really doesn't stand out at all. Did the ground freeze for them or no? The, the, the ground froze. So when the when the um, thank you. Thank you. moved out of there, it was it was pretty good. They had to do some backblading in some areas, so they were called back for that. But there's this. Someone made a comment from UCR that if the if the um, rut is less than eight it's inches, it'll fill like in. The oh, okay. So, so there were some bigger ones that they they did do. And there was some um, slash left around, so we got that out of there. But really, I had to punch list of three things. That's pretty efficient, didn't, didn't we say? Oh, they were they were absolutely March. great. Because I thought we were nervous One about March. One and a March. half, two and a half weeks. Of so they, they used the deadline. We got the we got the weather right. We yeah. used the right company that won, that had the equipment, they had great equipment to go in there. <laughs> they basically they could reach from the road in a lot of spots. Yeah. <laughs> but they just they just got in on a wing and a prayer. With and then the the, the forester marked all the trees, yeah. and then the plan got changed, and he had to go back. All and we had to thank Home Depot because they matched the That's bark of a tree yeah. or something like that. So he painted all over all the um, blue paint. And you couldn't even tell. Like I had to walk right up to it to because he was explaining it to me. I'm like, well, how are they not? All right, we got two quick things. Uh, minutes for approval. Did we actually get minutes? We, we did. We got them in the uh, email. Do I have a, a <coughs> voice, I think? Does anybody have any edits to the minutes? Nope. I motion. Move, I move we approve the minutes for January 8th, 2020. All, all those in favor? All right. And then I've got one last thing I wanted to just add. I know we're already here late. So welcome, everybody, obviously. So normally, we do site visits. We, well, we've, since I've been on the commission, we've been moving it around. We've been tending to do site visits for our project on Tuesdays at 9.30, which is a, usually an inconvenient time. A.M. Yes. <laughs> A.M. Um, I wanted to just, site visits are a really valuable time to actually go see the project. It's really when you understand what's going on. 9.30's worked out because Chuck can get out there with us and we can kind of get some background from him, some understanding from him. But I want to make sure we're doing a time that's convenient for the most people to attend. Um, there's nothing preventing you from just going out there and seeing the site yourself if you can't make the visit. But, uh, you know, I want to, what I'll even say is, I think what we'll do is continue it for this next one. But keep in mind, like, if there's a time that works best for you to go out there, um, we can do that. For me, Chuck, what you guys have obliged is typically a lunch hour. Yeah. Because I'm only, I'm, I'm, like luckily I'm close to Reading, so I can scoot home. Stay for half an hour, and thirty five minutes, and come back. I'm I'm in the same boat with you on that. Maybe you and I should just plan. I know. It so be in normal business hours for Chuck. So there were so it does not have to be at normal business hours. Um, Chuck, Chuck does not work Fridays. Chuck doesn't work Friday. Um, Chuck doesn't have to be there. Mm -hmm. It's just I tend to feel that it's valuable to have him. No um, kidding. Particularly <laughs> from the uh, wetland delineation standpoint, uh, our best wetland delineator used to sit in this chair and is no longer here. Um, so Chuck now has that. The, 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 the do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's, when we're looking at a line and whether this should be up or down, he's, uh, you know, wetland scientists are the best ones to have oh, evaluate that. It's still that. more valuable for me because I have typically gone to the end or after work. And Chuck says, hey, go by this side, I can do that. But obviously it would be better if, someone was, if I was with someone. So if noon works a couple times, I can Think about it. We'll, we'll keep it the same for this next meeting, but either let me know or we can bring it up at the next meeting if, 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 if there's a good when time. Can come? What's that? <laughs> when can Catherine come? Cat, you know, she, she's at school at uh, daycare <laughs> at 930, <laughs> so that was just a special day that she got to do that site visit. Uh, uh, Andrew will come to the next one. And <laughs> maybe can, can we circulate um, contacts yeah. as well? Yeah. Yes. Because um, yeah. sometimes when we're at a site visit, if we expect someone, if somebody doesn't make it, sometimes we, we meet in town hall and then we carpool to the sites. 
And if um, it, maybe somebody joins us halfway through, but it's good to I'll know. I'll give you a great example. Like, I'm often late, mm -hmm. and, and so then it, I have to call. Where's everybody at? Number <laughs> and just say, well, which site are you at now? And so it just saves a lot of time. Are notes put together from the site visits that they are used shared? To be. So that, like, if so, if you can't go with the group, at least you can go and see what has yeah. already been. We can thought. revitalize that. So they we used to be. put some notes together. At the very least, what we still do is um, on a typical. You know, this was a, a little bit of a unique meeting, but on a typical hearing when they open up, we let the applicant usually present their project, and then what we do is we'll we'll say we did a site visit. This is what we saw mm -hmm. um, as an opportunity to kind of give the observations for the it's just, great to have that that list it hasn't been done for two or three years. Typically um, checking through some of those pictures. Right. Yeah, you did notes people. I I think it was the commission that was doing the notes, right? We, we did the so notes. One of the yeah. Right. One of the commission members would take it put off. notes together for the rest yeah. of the commission. Yeah. I don't even know if it made it into an order. But it made I don't, it. I don't, do think, it. I don't think they do, yeah. We used to. You just get sent around an email, like, What's here's what we saw on the site visit, here's some pictures. So, so we could do, do, do that. you do still send the photos? What's that? You do still send pictures? You, you know, here's I a, think that was, that'd be easy. you know, <coughs> specific well, things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Days. It was really, um, so most of the site visits for the last couple of years were for me and uh, uh, Becky. Becky. Yeah, Becky Longley. And um, we do, you know, so we just reported back to the commission. I mean, so it, it, it worked out. She was a consultant, and you know, I'm doing this. And so it was, we had a good uh, feel for each other. But if, but if other people are interested in start going, we could, we could bring things like in. two tomcats circling <laughs> each other, spitting and gnashing at each other when they get out there. Everything's always like great an old married couple. <laughs> <laughs> he talks all tough now because Becky's not here. Yeah, she invited she's me over to her house over next over week. She was here. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's up in she? she she Maine. She be all over oh, this, yeah. this stuff right yeah. now. Yeah. So, so Chuck, do you live in Reading? No, I live yeah. in Arlington. You live in Arlington. Yeah. Would it ever be hard for you to come out on a weekend? Yeah. So I don't think I would be. I would want to do that. I, I think in the past when I first got here, the commission met on Sundays and on Mo Mondays. So or we used to like do that. Monday, like one of the meetings out. And they would do like, it by themselves, like Sunday Mondays morning. at like four, five. We used to get together and. Do it, and, and Chuck never used to go. Um, and I think that they were loaded with expertise back in the day. Yeah. No, they were. I think they were. Yeah. And um, and then it kind of evolved, and I and I went. But I, so on Tuesdays we're here until seven. I mean that must give some opportunity, yeah. some more opportunity. Yeah. That could definitely. Um, yeah, I, mean, I don't know around. if that works. So so, so anyway. summertime, summer summertime summer. it's a lot easier yeah. to do mm -hmm. that. Daylight. So spring comes around, it's easier to move that to. All right, when everybody's getting out of work, let's mm -hmm. try to have a meeting late in the day because you can yeah. get there, you can see it. Yeah. Right now, you can't do 5 o'clock at start. Yeah, yeah, yeah looking yeah. at the plan is, is hard. So we don't, look, we don't go on site visits in Arlington, and I can tell mm -hmm. you, this, this is great. We, we're faster. We close quicker. Uh, it helps you understand the project if you can get out to every, every site. And, you know, you're not talking about something, you know, you start talking about the wetland line and where the shed is or something like that. And if you're not out there, you don't understand exactly, well, and you spend 10 minutes on it or something. It's what we just said about the DEP for another meeting. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, tough to see the stuff on paper. But, but I'm available. It doesn't have to be just one time. If it ended up being, oh, well, this group can go at this time and then another group go to at other times, and that, maybe that's how it works. Could sometimes the most I, no. efficient have been when you say we're going on Tuesday, we talk about it. That's usually like if we're if getting a bigger, consultant to, oh, to okay. meet us out there. But we might adjourn and let Tim go home. Yes. Uh, make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All those in favor. Thank you.